Welcome back to day two of the Committee on Offshore Science and Assessment. We are thrilled to be back with you all um, to, oh, excuse me, uh, to be discussing some additional study profiles today. Um, and thank you, Rodney, for the cake yesterday evening. Congratulations again on 50 years. Um, before we get underway, I'm going to just repeat a few housekeeping items and looking around the room. I think most people that are in the room with us today were here yesterday, um, but I'll just remind folks that um, as our quick safety minute, if there is an emergency for any reason, you'll go out to the rotunda. There are very large doors immediately to your left, and those are um, the emergency exit. We will congregate on C Street in front of the building. Um, in normal business, if you need to enter or exit our building, there are two entrances and exits. One is on uh, the north end of our building at C Street, the other um, south on Constitution, which is probably where you all came in. Uh, and then restrooms are um, a little hard to describe in this building, but uh, if you go out to that rotunda, make a right towards the main room and then a left down the hallway, they should be on your left. Uh, a few housekeeping items for those not in the room. Please uh, do remain muted if not called upon to speak. We'll do our best in the room to help uh, mitigate or monitor that, but um, we appreciate your assistance in keeping our meeting as interruption-free as possible. Uh, for those in the room, you know, please do consider logging into the Zoom um, and please remember to use your microphone because uh, the microphones are connected uh, to the audio in Zoom. Um, and then appreciate the very robust chat that we had going on yesterday. We are going to try to capture some of those chat comments and uh, find the most appropriate way to share them with uh, our BOEM colleagues. Um, I do not monitor the chat for the purposes of integrating <laughs> feedback there into the discussion. But again, as I said, we will try to capture that feedback. Um, and then I think that's all. Have I missed any important housekeeping items? I'll turn it then to our co-chairs and then we'll do a quick round of introductions. Okay, um, I'll keep this very brief. Welcome everybody to day two of the COSA meeting to discuss a select number of study profiles um, in the BOEM SDP. Um, thanks everybody for joining us. We had some excellent discussions yesterday. We discussed six profiles and we're going to uh, discuss four more today. Um, we appreciate the program intro introductions from folks and the profiles and the outside experts and, of course, COSA member insights. Today, we're going to hear from the Minerals Management Program and also from the Gulf of Mexico and Alaska. Um, as well as the case yesterday, we encourage presenters to limit their slides uh, discussions to around about seven minutes so that we can have lots of time for discussion. Uh, I also want to welcome everybody uh, to today's sessions. We, we, uh, I think speaking on behalf of some of the oldsters from the team who've been here for a while, yesterday's uh, uh, review session was, uh, to me, was one of the best we've had in terms of the quality of the feedback and uh, the, the dialogue that went on. And I really appreciate everybody's participation, the candor, uh, but also the constructive nature of the comments that were, were shared. Um, I want to thank all of our BOEM uh, participants. Uh, and look, uh, we, I see we have a few extras joining us today, including, I think I see Bill. Bill there. Hi, Bill. Good to have you here. Uh, you missed the birthday cake yesterday. Too bad. But uh, uh, maybe maybe they'll save a piece for you. And uh, it's uh, and, and I also want to really thank our, our guests who, who called in. They, they added tr tremendously to the, uh, the quality of the discussions yesterday, and I look forward to that. Uh, continuing today. So, uh, yeah, let's get after it. Excellent. So with that, I think um, I'll turn it over to Bill Brown to offer some remarks as well. Yeah, and I, I hope you can hear me okay. Let me let me know if there's an issue. Uh, uh, Scott, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm uh, sorry I, I missed the, uh, the cake. Uh, and I, I would love to be there, but I'm on Long Island right now. Uh, we've been meeting with uh, the Shinnecock Tribal Nation, uh, and I'm actually currently at the offices of the 
uh, Uncachug, uh, uh, recognized, state recognized Indian tribe on Long Island too. And the chief is, has been nice enough to set me up in the backyard of the office. Um, we're, there's a smaller group of us that is up here is, is, uh, uh, an item that where we secured $600,000 from the bill funding, the bipartisan infrastructure, uh, law for, uh, uh, what we've initially described as uh, submerged tribal heritage, a visualization project for that, and and so we're we're talking to the the Shinnecock uh, about that. So I'm gonna I'm gonna just quickly move through some highlights uh, of of Bohm, and uh, but I, I I see there are a lot of Bohm staff that are present. So if you know after I finish, if there are questions, please join in to me because. Some of the staff know know more about the nuances than I do, uh, but uh, to begin, uh, there are several rulemakings that I think uh, are of interest uh, to the the committee. There was a final rulemaking on January thirty first of this year uh, that we call the Bohm Bessie Split Rule, Renewable Energy Split Rule, and fundamentally that was when. Uh, when the two agencies were created, uh, uh, the Offshore Wind Enforcement Authority was was actually placed temporarily with BOEM for inspection and enforcement. Bessie has generally has had those functions, and the split rule uh, formally, from a regulatory point of view, assigned the inspection and enforcement tasks for offshore wind to Bessie. So that's that rule. Uh, we did. We have proposed also in January on the 30th the uh, renewable energy modernization rule, and I won't go into it in more than that. But it's quite detailed, and it's it's largely to uh, make the process more efficient and take into account the experience that we've had uh, uh, with offshore wind. There's another proposed rule that was issued on archaeology for oil and gas. And uh, I mean, think to really summarize that we had had an issue requiring surveys before exploration, before anyone drilled. And uh, this new rule gives would give explicit authority to do that. I'll note it's just for oil and gas. There's a separate archeological regulatory uh, requirements for offshore, for, uh, offshore wind. And then uh, as I'm sure, uh, Scott will note if I don't, where we are also continuing to develop a carbon sequestration uh, rule, which was mandated by Congress, and, and it's not out yet. But I, I do promise the staff are working diligently on it, and they are in the process of trying to create uh, 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 the beginnings of a program, uh, you know, to embed that regulatory system in. So it's you know it's more than just a regulation. Uh, we are uh, we're in the process of updating our tribal consultation policy. We've just just started a, 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 the first of concrete steps, which is internally to do, do some red lines for the current policy that would update it. Uh, and uh, it's some of the tribes have asked us to do that. And then we we intend after we uh, get agreement within BOEM to send that out to uh, send it to the 574 tribal nations that are recognized by the federal government and invite consultation on, on that. There's a lot going on with wind energy, and I'll just note a few things that, that we are expecting to designate wind energy areas offshore Oregon and the Central Atlantic. These things are all we expect by the end of the year. We expect to hold a wind lease sale for the Gulf of Mexico. We've, we have recently approved our third uh, uh, project off the Atlantic for offshore wind, the Ocean Wind Project. It was approved last week and, and uh, under its plan could build up to 98 turbines and 1.1 gigawatts of power capacity. It's the third approved project. The, the, the first two were Vineyard Wind 1 and Southwark Wind. And we are expecting decisions on construction operation plans uh, coming up uh, probably in this year for Revolution Wind, Empire Wind, Sea Vow, New England Wind, and Sunrise Wind. Uh, on oil and gas, uh, 
uh, we expect to issue the proposed final program, which essentially is the final program subject to uh, a, a uh, review by the uh, uh, the uh, a brief review period by the Congress. Uh, we expect to issue that final program for the next five years sometime this year. And we also expect a whole lease sale 261 for oil and gas in the Gulf of Mexico. On program staff and budget, uh, a key thing is we've uh, uh, we've have appointed Jessica Bravo as as Bohm's Def deputy chief environmental officer. So please congratulate Jessica. I think she's largely been playing that role. Yeah, uh, she's doing an amazing job. Uh, and uh, and also Erica Statterman, who some of you have uh, I think gotten to know, is is now the deputy manager of the of the of the CMA. Uh, our uh, um, center for marine acoustics, and and uh, and that's going to be you know, the, uh, a great help for for Jill, so that Jill can focus on not just the CMA but other things more easily. Uh, and we are moving forward with an effort. Thank you again. <laughs> uh, with uh, uh, to hire a senior innovation uh, officer, uh, you know, in this initiative that I know you know we have to promote innovation. And uh, we hope to establish a center that we don't have that fully approved yet, but we're, we've, we can move forward with a person that would be the leader of it. Um, we expect to issue with NOAA a North Atlantic right whale and offshore wind strategy this fall, it's the plan. And uh, to note, we've received one, $7 million in uh, Inflation Reduction Act funding for environmental studies and monitoring work that relate to the strategy. We also received 6.5 million in IRA funding to establish a regional passive acoustic monitoring PAM network, uh, and uh, uh, and to also uh, to use that to identify the larger scale uh, movements and distribution of of uh, Atlantic marine mammals. And and we also have issued a, a million dollar, one million dollar contract for underwater acoustic impact modeling. Uh, we are planning uh, with NOAA on an interagency agreement with them in support of baseline environmental and social cultural analyses for the U.S. territories. And I believe you know that BOEM's OCS jurisdiction was extended to the territories by the IRA, and it also provided, the IRA did give a lot of money, which is helpful. Uh, it provided $7.5 million for research and wind energy development related to the territories. And our initial focus is Puerto Rico, which is by far, has by far the largest population uh, uh, of, of the U.S. territories. And then one other final item to note, we received $5 million in addition to all of this through the IRA for what we're calling foundational environmental studies to inform decisions on energy and minerals. So uh, that is my list. And with that, I'll stop and invite questions. Thank you so much, Bill. Um, I will just note briefly that I realized I forgot to do introductions, so apologies for that. Um, but let's go ahead and take questions and then we can do some around the room introductions before we get started. So I'll look for hands both in the room and online uh, for any questions for Bill. Scott. Yeah, I'm, the, I'm the chief environmental officer of BOEM. That's what I, what I do. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bill. Appreciate, we greatly appreciate that overview. That was uh, very helpful. I'm sure we'll have some follow-up questions on, on some of the items there. I know I do, but I, I wanna to touch on a different topic that you didn't touch on that I do think is of high interest to those of us in COSA. You may recall a year or so ago, two years ago, you uh, instigated a study that a couple of us in this room were involved in called the First in Class Study. One of the uh, findings of that study was that uh, characteristic of premier um, uh, applied science organizations was incorporating uh, uh, DEI perspectives into the uh, work processes and programs of that, that organization. Um, I, I know that's something that uh, figures into the, uh, the SDP document, 
but we really haven't heard too much about it in the course of our profiles that we've been looking at. I wonder if you can comment a little bit on, on the status of what's happened in terms of DEI uh, at BOEM in, uh, uh, since, uh, since the first in class study came out. I think all of us on the committee would be quite interested in hearing about that. Yeah, I, I, I can comment a, a little bit and I, and I, and I would invite uh, Jessica or anyone else who wants to add after I finish to add things. But uh, the first thing actually uh, is is not uh, bone per se, but the National Academy of Science, Engineering and Medicine, which uh, uh, recently decided, uh, as a, perhaps you know, to uh, uh, launch a study on what I'll, it's like JEDI, D-E-I-A. It, it has another element in its acronym for on belonging, but it's something that was uh, uh, the, uh, and, and it's a study is on those, those characteristics, how to advance them within the ocean sciences uh, and initiative uh, of the ocean science board. Uh, and they brought that up. Uh, it was brought up by the board a couple of years ago and we had a panel and there were a number of federal employees uh, there and, um, I was there and we committed $100,000 to uh, to support it. We've provided that now. Uh, and uh, the Naval Research Lab has provided support. I understand there is likely to be other federal support. So what they have, what the Academy is doing now that we expect to help on and be part of is a two-year study with about a million dollars in funding uh, to address these issues. So. Uh, it's kind of, I think that's an exciting thing that's going generally. Uh, we, uh, we have a number of elements of what is a, a JEDI or DEIA work plan that BOEM has, has developed. Uh, um, and I do include in that, Scott, our, our tribal work. It's, it's related to that. Uh, we have, uh, we have, we're, we're in the process of conducting quarterly environmental justice forums that are uh, related to New York by particularly. Um, I, we're doing uh, uh, sort of uh, outreach to improve our recruitment of uh, uh, individuals from disadvantaged communities and certainly including black and tribal groups. Um, and uh, and first in class is very much on my mind and, and Brian Jordan and Jessica have taken uh, a leadership role in, in you know, uh, making sure that we live up to our commitment to honor the implementation of the 18 attributes that were laid out there. But let me ask Jessica to join in because she's better than I am at remembering the details of everything we've done. Yeah, thanks, Bill. I think that was a, a good overview. And, and I would also uh, highlight the remarks that Ronnie gave yesterday when we're uh, talking about the studies program as well and how to more fully incorporate tribes into the various stages of development of the SDP. Um, we're contemplating a series of webinars and workshops, um, and we're really thinking about how to involve tribes more in our studies program in terms of participating um, in data collection, study design, data analysis, et cetera. Um, and so that's one effort that we're doing. I would say for first in class, um, we are also uh, about to receive the final report for our Evaluating Connections Feedback Loop study, um, and that we are excited to share with you guys once it's final. Um, it's gonna provide a lot of insights as to kind of where we stand within those 18 attributes of the first in class um, environmental program. Um, and we'll be looking for a contractor to help us think through um, some of the early uh, actions for process improvements and performance metrics including on DEIA. Um, and then the last thing that I would note is that the Bureau is uh, very, very close to bringing on board our diversity and inclusion officer, which is the first step in setting up our diversity, inclusion, and civil rights office, um, which we'll build out over the next few years that will really help us bring people in um, to our own staff and concentrate on that outreach as well, um, and help us think through how to improve processes, including our studies processes. Yeah, and we're actually, we're also hiring an environmental justice uh, coordinator 
uh, um, uh, who will do uh, uh, Justice 40, if you followed that concept, uh, work for both Bohm and Bessie. So we're in the process there. Actually, I, I, I see now, I, I had added a paragraph on on, on uh, uh, Jedi issues for my opening remarks, and I, I've been traveling. I printed out the one that the least, up, less updated version. So Scott, I'm glad you mentioned it. I wanted to raise it initially. Thank you, Jeremy, your hand is up. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Bill and, and Jessica. Just first as, as a follow-up, um, I think it would be great if uh, when with the, the study profiles, if you're going out to, to universities, you look uh, to uh, HBCUs uh, and, and as well look for, uh, even when you have uh, a non-HBCU as a lead, look for them to, to partner with an H, a HBCU and or, and or a, a, a tribal nation. So that's one of the ways, rather than just seeking input into the profiles, but actually uh, engaging uh, those communities in, in the research. So uh, anyway, it sounds like you're doing a lot of great things um, and you've got a lot on your plate. One thing you didn't talk about all was uh, your workforce uh, and uh, how, you know, how are you going to grow out your, your workforce to meet the, the challenges that, that you have? I mean, just even with offshore wind, uh, obviously you've got a lot on your plate, but if, if we start bringing in things as well, like critical minerals and carbon capture, uh, so w what's, what's the plan there? <laughs> well, I mean, that's, uh, it's a good question. Uh, uh, you know, without without trying to remember all the details, we've we in the in the past for this fiscal year, uh, uh, we've uh, we've ad we're, we've added a substantial number of people and and have additional funds for uh, offshore wind, for example, uh, and that those added staff uh, and the money is is. To some degree, spread across uh, Bohm. The the largest growth is in our Office of Renewable Energy Programs, uh, um, but uh, but there's funding elsewhere. Uh, and uh, uh, on on critical minerals, there I believe, and actually I see Jeff Ridenauer, I think, and so he should probably comment on that. Uh, and carbon capture and storage, the uh, uh, we were given no new money, uh, which is kind of unfortunate. So um, maybe we'll be in a stronger place to pass for more resources after we get further down the road with policy. Let me invite Jeff, though, to talk about the marine mineral side of it, since I actually see him. Hi, Bill. Thanks. Look, you look comfortable out there. <laughs> it's nice. Yeah. Uh, I was very honored the chief actually came, you know, set up this table and chair himself for me. So he was thinking of you guys. Yeah, uh, addressing Jeremy's question. Yeah, uh, critical mineral workforce. We have two individuals right now working on critical minerals. But I think a, a broader concern is actually having uh, nationwide expertise to deal with critical minerals offshore. That's a pretty shallow pool of expertise to draw from. So, um, but yeah, that's a concern. And um, and just speaking in general for the, for the marine minerals program, we're we're growing and we. Uh, we, we do need uh, some additional staffing. So yeah, we're aware of that, thanks. And Jeremy, we are, we are in the process of hiring a, a, a tribal coordination officer that will uh, report to our tribal liaison officer. So at least we'll have uh, uh, sort of two people in headquarters. I believe at this point, uh, the regions uh, all have or ex intend to hire, to have a full-time tribal person in each region. So we do have added resources there. It's really the offshore wind renewable part of the program that has has benefited by a very substantial increase in funding this this year. Thank you, Bill. 
I don't see any additional questions in the room or online at the moment, but I'm very happy to channel any that come in uh, towards probably Jessica or Bill directly <laughs> um, and get some responses for, for folks. Uh, I do want to take just a very quick moment. I'm going to ask folks in the room to be real quick about it, but I'd like to do introductions. I feel extremely remiss having not done that as part of our um, opening. So I'm going to start with our co-chairs um, and then we'll go around the room um, very quickly and then any committee members that are online. Good morning, everybody. I'm Rod Mather. I'm a professor of underwater archaeology and applied history at the University of Rhode Island and I co-chair COSA. Good morning, uh, I'm Scott Cameron. I'm a geologist. I was at Shell for 32 years working in exploration, production and development, uh, consulting uh, in the last 10, and I am uh, uh, the co-chair of COSA. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Okay, Jonathan Tucker, uh, National Academy staff um, and a geologist by training. I'm Jessica Bravo. I'm BOEM's Chief and uh, Deputy Chief Environmental Officer. Thank you. I'm Katrin Eichen. I'm with the University of Alaska Fairbanks and I'm a marine biologist and I'm a COSA member. My name is Emily Young. I'm a Canals Marine Policy Fellow. My background is in deep sea ecology and this year I'm thinking about climate change and climate literacy at BOEM. Hi, good morning. I'm Kevin Stokesbury. I'm a COSA member. Uh, I'm also the Dean of um, the School for Marine Science and Technology at the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth. And I work on uh, uh, marine invertebrates and fish uh, and in fisheries, fisheries oceanography. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jack Barth, Professor of Oceanography at Oregon State University and a physical oceanographer and COSA member. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Rodney Clark, Chief of Bones Division of Environmental Sciences in the Environmental Studies Program. Hi, uh, Jill Lewandowski. So I oversee our environmental assessment work at Bone from a national perspective, and I also direct our Center for Marine Acoustics. Good morning. I'm Eric Taylor. I'm the Studies Chief with the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management out of the Alaska region. I am Dave Perexta, the avian biologist from the Pacific region and currently the acting studies chief for the Pacific. Uh, good morning, I'm Laura Turner with the BOEM Ocean Energy Management and the Marine Middles Program. Hi, Rona Cox, I'm a professor of geosciences at uh, Williams College, a COSA member, and I'm a coastal geomorphologist and um, sedimentologist. Uh, hi, Jeff Ridenauer, I'm the chief of the Marine Minerals Division and also wear uh, uh, the uh, Environmental Studies Chief hat for the Marine Minerals Program. And I'm Lori Suma, also a geologist, retired from ExxonMobil, uh, mainly in exploration and research, and now adjunct at Rice and uh, UT Austin and a COSA member. Uh, good morning, Jeremy Firestone. I'm a professor at the University of Delaware in the School of Marine Science and Policy. I'm a COSA member. Uh, recovering government lawyer and a social scientist. I don't know if we can top that. Hi, uh, good morning, everyone. Carrie Pomeroy, research social scientist based at the Institute of Marine Sciences at UC Santa Cruz. My background is in applied sociology and anthropology and marine policy. Thank you. Oh, and I'm a COSA member. Yoko Furukawa, BOEM OEP, and I'm also, uh, my background is in marine geology and geological oceanography. Thank you. And I'm Stacey Karras, Program Officer with the Ocean Studies Board of the National Academies and Study Director for the committee. Uh, real quickly, Eric, we'll go to you and then we'll go to the folks around the room and we'll touch on any committee members on the line. Hi, everyone. Eric Isco, uh, Program Assistant. Well, I am one. I'm Shane Long, I'm working out for the ESG, the Sciences, back on this other way Hi, I'm Erica Satterman, Deputy Director of the Center for Marine Acoustics. Hello, everyone. My name is Bob Lewis. I work for DTECT. Um, we help our clients and developers uh, manage um, their airspaces with uh, radar um, for aircraft detection lighting systems and bird management systems for curtailment and um, um, migrations. I'm Jonathan Mitty. 
Excellent. Thank you. And I believe the only committee member that we have joining us remotely is Susan. Uh, Susan, are you on the line? Yes. Hi, I'm uh, Susan Parks. I am a professor of biology at Syracuse University, um, focused on marine mammal acoustic communication and the effects of noise. Thanks. Thank you, Susan. All right. So apologies for that slight detour, but I'm glad that we had an opportunity to, to provide introductions. Um, we'll turn next to Jeff Reidenhauer, who's going to be providing the introduction to the marine minerals uh, profiles. Uh, thanks, Stacy. So I have a few slides to provide the introduction. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm the chief of the Marine Minerals Division at BOEM, and the division is part of the overall Marine Minerals Program in the Bureau. And the division sits within the Office of uh, Strategic Resources in the headquarters office, which is located in uh, Sterling, Virginia. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is just provide a, a, a brief introduction to the program for those of, of you who aren't uh, familiar with it and then talk about our informational needs from an environmental studies perspective, and then uh, introduce the two profiles that we're gonna be uh, presenting today. So the program uh, is a relatively small group within the Bureau. As Rodney mentioned yesterday, I think the uh, Bureau has roughly 600 employees. Well, the program has 21 uh, currently fully dedicated staff working on marine minerals. So that's a, that's a small program, but growing program, should I say. Um, uh, and we're environmental stewards of uh, mineral resources on the OCS. So we have a big responsibility and in 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 actually with the uh, passing of the IRA, uh, giving us leasing authority in the territories that uh, that footprint has grown to. So, uh, I want to thank Rodney and his uh, environmental studies team over the last numerous years for providing us invaluable support for environmental studies for the program because it really has helped us out with our decision making process. So kudos to Rodney and his team. Uh, the program uh, provides sediment for beach nourishment and coastal resilience projects such as uh, coastal wetland restoration, barrier island uh, creation, that type of thing. And we do this through primarily through uh, negotiated non-competitive agreements for uh, sand for uh, other federal agencies like the Army Corps of Engineers, NASA, the Department of Defense, uh, as well as uh, state agencies and local government agencies. We also authorize, issue authorizations for geophysical and geological surveys for, for primarily sand. Uh, and we use the information that's collected from our environmental studies to uh, inform our decisions with regards to that, uh, uh, those actions. Um, we also use it for our consultation work uh, through the Endangered Species Act and National Historic Preservation Act. So it's really important uh, information that we utilize in our decision-making process. As part of our work, we've been developing over the last several years what we call a national offshore sand inventory. Now, this is separate from the environmental studies process. We use program funding to do this. But the reason I mention this is it's, it's really important for the program in terms of identifying sediment resources for projects, but also uh, in terms of deconflicting potential future uh, infrastructure that's placed in the uh, uh, in, uh, nearshore environment, especially export cables from uh, offshore wind farms that may cut through in significant sediment resources. So we've been uh, working closely with OREP uh, on addressing these issues. So the National Offshore Sand Inventory is really uh, critical to that. Uh, another growing uh, part of our uh, portfolio, so to speak, is offshore critical minerals, and we've mentioned that a few times already. But um, we do have, as I mentioned, two staff fully dedicated to critical minerals, and we do have some program funding that we dedicate to uh, uh, conducting offshore critical mineral work, and we partner with primarily USGS and NOAA. Uh, to do work offshore. And this is expensive work. It's far offshore, it's deep water. So we leverage resources from those partner agencies to do that. But as part of that work to basically identify where critical mineral bearing resources may be located, we, we twine that with environmental studies uh, money to do some foundational environmental work, uh, identifying uh, ecological communities that may be associated with these uh, unique deposits, so to speak. Next slide. 
so this uh, this slide summarizes our informational needs as a program. Uh, we, we need to increase our understanding of the benthic impacts from uh, dredging activities. Uh, we need to understand the practical implications of long practice mitigation uh, for dredging. Uh, we are uh, utilizing the information to develop tools to support multi-use conflict evaluations. And as, as I mentioned with critical minerals, uh, we are, we're utilizing environmental studies money to collect uh, Base, baseline environmental data that we can use to evaluate potential uh, impacts from future critical mineral, both exploration and development. Next slide. So we are gonna be presenting two study profiles today. Uh, Dina Hansen, who's a marine scientist in the division and the marine minerals program, is gonna be presenting on uh, a study called Extrapolating Benthic Recovery Estimates Beyond Single Project Constraints. And this will provide um, uh, support to address several questions of importance to our analysis with regard to dredging projects, and then also test the applicability of the model to diverse, uh, a diverse range of uh, settings and benthic communities. Now this project uh, profile concept has kind of been on our list uh, for a couple of years. So we're hoping to get some comments uh, from the COSA to maybe more fully bake the idea so that may uh, may eventually uh, reach the uh, national studies list. Next slide. And then uh, Laura Turner is gonna be our first presenter. She's gonna uh, present a profile called Coastal Marine e and Ecological Classification Standard Application. And this would be used to uh, apply to both uh, offshore mineral and energy development. And she'll describe uh, uh, the reasons we need to do this in terms of having a consistent and common standard. Uh, the uh, study will develop documents identifying uh, rele uh, relevant habitat units and workflows. And then it'll be used to improve the quality of data for our pre-development uh, uh, and post-development analyses. Uh, that's it. I'll take any questions if anybody has any. Thanks, Jeff. Yep. <laughs> I have a question. I see this. Oh, I'll just remind folks in the room to please turn your audio off if you're on. Oh. I, I don't think it's the mics. It's actually somebody's computer, so. probably. Uh, okay. No, I was muted. So, so uh, a, a, a quick question for you. Is my soul alternator? I just sorry. Senior moment here, Jeff. A qu thanks for that overview. A, a, a quick question for you. Uh, in the original uh, uh, submittal we got from Bohm, there was another proposal that was, I believe, ranked number one in your SDP on uh, developing a critical minerals environmental assessment framework, which seemed like a fairly critical. I, has to use that word, um, uh, contribution to your portfolio of research at this time, given the importance of critical minerals in the territories and, and the activities you're looking at. It, it, is that still being considered or is that, uh, it just needs more work to before? The, uh, can you tell us? It is still being considered. The reason we, we, we kind of swapped it out for uh, Dina's uh, project was, it's really a literature review and we didn't feel that was really that, Okay. At this point, uh, uh, I don't know. We didn't really feel we'd get a whole lot of okay. constructive feedback on just a literature review. Okay. It's not like it had, this was the first phase of a multi-phase project. You know, it was just the initial phase. So we didn't really feel at this point in time it was okay. constructive to, you know. So it's not dropping off your radar. So. No, no, it's okay. definitely still on the radar. Thank you. Absolutely. Much. Yep. Hi. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. In your, in your presentation, you mentioned the development of um, tools to support multi-use conflicts. And with the expansion of renewables into the Gulf of Mexico, those may in increase. And I wondered whether the tools that you're developing might be more broadly available and applicable to, to multi-use conflicts within BOA. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, it, it, we envision, uh, you know, these... Uh, tools to uh, inform, for example, 
uh, carbon sequestration and capture infrastructure that may be placed, you know, on the OCS, that type of thing. And uh, also uh, working with uh, other potential infrastructure that may be placed. Uh, yeah, there's a, there's a long history of oil and gas infrastructure cutting through sediment resources in the Gulf of Mexico. So there's a lot of lessons learned there that we could apply to this, uh, uh, you know, these tools and this, this procedure moving forward for other, other uh, infrastructure. So. Thank you. I note that Les also has his hand raised um, I'm going to give him an opportunity to ask a very quick question. We are running about 10 minutes behind this, so I want to get us uh, wrapped up and um, get folks uh, able to present their profiles. So go ahead, Les, real quick. Les, you're muted. Yeah, yeah, got it, got it, got it. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, I'm, by the way, I'm a professor in the Marine Program at Boston University and work a lot with BOEM. Uh, I just want to mention regarding Dina's project that uh, recent work uh, associated with monitoring of cable laying troughs suggests that the recovery time for benthic communities on the Eastern Continental Shelf is way longer than people have supposed even in dynamic environments such as sand. So uh, the priority for the project over the long term uh, should be higher uh, because I think we really have to consider dredge bottoms as essentially altered for at least 50 years. Thanks. All right, thank you, Les. So uh, with that, I want to uh, get us underway and invite Laura Turner to provide her presentation on her profile, um, Coastal Marine and Ecological Classification Standard Application Offshore Energy and Minerals Development. Laura, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, good morning again, I'm Laura Turner. That is a, definitely a title, isn't it? <laughs> mm. um, it's also known as CMAX. Um, and obviously I'm hoping to apply that application in regards to offshore energy and minerals. Um, I'm all sure we're aware of miscommunication in our daily lives. It may, it may be through language or differing methods we use. Uh, yesterday, I asked my husband to put my computer in the trunk. And then he looked at me, you know, I looked at him kind of funny, but he's British, right? So he would have understood if I asked him to put it in the boot, you know? So we all have, but as Americans, we would have never put a computer in our boots, right? <laughs> so anyways, I... I wanted to kind of bring something to relevance of what we wish to do. Um, this proposed study concentrates on trying to find a common consistent methods and language for site characterization used by planners, developers, engineers, and scientists. Um, and it's, you know, I don't un under un underestimate that challenge that brings. Um, we've had a lot of internal interest. Um, Co-author is uh, Brandon Jensen from Renewable Energy, Mark Mueller from Environmental Sciences, Paul Knorr from Critical Minerals, and Kirby Dobbs also from Marine Minerals. We've all had pretty heavy discussions on this topic. The encouraging side, there is a framework. Um, CMEX exists and, um, and provides that basis for interpreting and classifying observational data from all types of sensors and platforms. It is a recognized federal standard. And uh, our NOAA colleagues, Mark Finkbeiner, Kate Rose, they are all very active in maintaining this standard. Um, and, you know, we at BOEM recognize the challenges of using the application in real world scenarios. Um, and Phil, there's a need for more guidance material that can bridge that language and the methods um, for better communication um, that can again be between planners, developers, and engineers and scientists, we're all on different languages there. Um, we are all human um, and probably the main conduit for simple or complex inconsistencies in data interpretation, um, which often lead to inadequate and occasionally confusing um, different types of for different types of consultations. Um, we also do recognize the need to operate at leasing and project scales to address different types of objectives, site characterization for habitat, fishing, site characterization from seabed topography, morphology, soil type, seismology, you name it. And this just introduces 
issues with differing mapping scales. Um, and I do have a slide to bring this topic back up towards the end towards questions. Those graphics on the right represent um, CMEX in practice. And uh, please note that the CMEX profile is aligned to the National Ocean Mapping and Exploration Characterization, and specifically the implementation plan objective, establish oceanic and characterization standards and protocols. Next slide, please. So our information need, we need those results of the site characterization reported consistently to evaluate the impact of proposed activities on physical, biological, and socioeconomic resources, which could be affected by the activities of wind energy development or mineral, marine mineral extraction. And just the pictures below depicting those activities. Uh, next slide, please. The key objective is to develop consistent seafloor characterization guidance that incorporates CMEX units that are relevant to energy and mineral site characterization that will allow that industry to interpret and provide survey disk consistently across an area. And then the graphic on the right represents the four key components. Um, the, the study will boundary, boundary conditions will be the substrate and the geoform components. Next slide, please. So with respect to methods, we envision conducting that workshop, identifying the bound issues with the data interpretation, gather those recommendations, and then do a desktop review of existing guidelines because they are out there. And then identify an area that includes offshore energy and minerals, and then using existing data from um, products for a site just to minimize the complexity of the study. Utilize CMEX as that framework, describe the environment using consistent tools and repeatable methods to improve our discussions, and then ultimately provide visual aids when working with CMEX and that primary audience being developers and the scientists interpreters. Next slide, please. Our research question, questions comprised of what are the primary descriptors needed to actually characterize an area with an energy and mineral site to inform NEPA? What are the minimum protocols? And what are the scientific engineering setting that crosswalk within the CMEX components that are needed to ensure consistent information? And then which scale um, should these features, sediment bodies be mapped to sufficiently meet the needs of essential fish habitat and other consultations for both minerals and energy? And then are all those different scales appropriate for different types? Next slide. So I have a couple questions that I'm hoping y'all help me out. Um, what, I do appreciate your feedback that we got in advance. That was extremely helpful. Um, so I listed out the grips. One of your questions was who we thought needed to be included. So I included some names, Marine Fisheries, most certainly industry, Fisheries Management Council, NOMAC working groups. Is there anyone that I'm missing on that list? My second question is, you know, am I missing a research question? Am I missing something on my points there? And the next slide, please. And then the big one, right? Where should we start? Plenty of coastal resilience activities and certainly energy is um, a lot of activities. And the next slide, please. And then should we narrow this get, um, study to just one type of scale? As you can see, those planning areas are huge. A lot of water space. Renewable energy leasings are pretty huge. And then those postage stamps, those little speckles on that screen, that's the marine minnows sand and gravel lease areas. And so just trying to hone into that component. So I will stop with that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Laura. I'll be looking again for the raised hands, um, both in person and uh, on the line. And I see that Rona's got her hand raised. Please go ahead, Rona. Oh, Rona, could you please see it? Sorry, um, really interesting presentation. Thank you uh, for all of that. Um, I, there's a lot of different groups working on this at the moment. Um, one of the things that concerned me when I read the original profile was that there was just a single reference in there. It was like to a 2007 study. Um, but there's an awful lot of current, recent and very current work on this. And so um, one of my concerns is that there, you might be working on this at the same time as other people are working on things that are very similar. And I'm thinking in particular here of the, the National Centers for Coastal and Ocean Science, um, which have uh, 
very recent work and, and are thinking about habitat classification in very similar terms. Um, and so um, I like the fact that you are thinking about engaging actively with partners, and I think that they're a key one. But one of my concerns is that if this ends up being duplicative in some way, um, and I'm wondering how you uh, would approach decreasing the misinformation and, uh, and as opposed to adding to that uh, too many names for too many things. It's a very valid point. We actually had all those references on the profile and thinned it out, actually. Um, I think the key is not to add, but to better, you know, and I I don't know what the total answer is, but I think including those, including them part of that discussion is important to get this characterization right and at least have something on the board that something that can be used effectively with other people that might not understand and trying to use it for some other purpose, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Yeah. There's, there are also groups in Europe doing similar work, and uh, there's a group at the Alfred Wegener um, Institute uh, in particular that I'm thinking about um, that I'd be happy, so I can send you some, uh, some ideas. That would be brilliant. Cool. Thank you. Um, we do have some of our invited guests on the line, and because we're running a little bit behind schedule, I'm going to um, skip the let them skip the line a bit. So I'm going to call on one of our former COSA members who I'm thrilled to see joining us, uh, Denise Reed. Very good to have you on the line, and I, I invite you to speak next. Denise, I saw you lower your hand, but I don't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I was, oh. my husband's cutting the grass outside. You should be able to hear that too now. Um, <laughs> um, Laura, I wonder, I'm, I'm, um, I'm struggling to understand the problem uh, a little bit more fully. I think when I first read this, I, I understood that you wanted to come up with something complementary to COMEX. And now I think what I'm hearing is that you want to have a more detailed guide that interprets the existing classification in a way that could be more readily defined, readily relatable to your interests. So maybe you could confirm whether that's the, 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 the um, you know, the goal. The other, the other comment is that you talk about habitat a lot. And then you talk about EFH consultations. But from my read, you were specifically looking at just geoform and substrate rather than biotic characteristics of this. And so I'm I wondered if you can help me understand how having a better idea of substrate would help you with your EFH without needing to think more about biotic then um, that would also be helpful. Could you kind of give me a little bit more context, I guess is what I'm asking, so I can provide some more informed comments? I will definitely try. Um, certainly, we're not trying to envision to develop, you know, another CMEX or no, nothing like that. Certainly complementary and certainly looking at it from guidelines from a perspective to help people, um, you know, I'm one of those people where I put a, put something in a contract and it says, oh, comply with CMEX and go off and do it. But you end up with five different versions when it comes back to you if you ask that same person to do it. So I think just trying to have those, those guidelines there to help us get through that. Uh, we focused more on the seabed side because we find that with the CMEX in itself, it goes down to the substrate and it, I'll try my best. I'm not a, a geologist, so I will try my best to give you an example. So you have uh, your G and G type folks that look, say, here's a ridge, and they draw a shape around that area. And then you're talking to the habitat folks, and they'll draw a shape around that same area, but not exactly the same things in different parameters. And so trying to put us on a setting that we can speak to each other. So when we're doing these interpretations, these these components are just a little bit clearer and the people that are actually performing that get you to a closer state that something's more consistent across those, those, those boundaries there. And I don't know if I've completely 
answered your question, but certainly looking for supplementary guidelines, um, you know, those kind of components. So essentially, essentially you're saying that, um, that you're asking people to use the classification and then not able to do it consistently, which is essentially what the classification was set up for originally, right? In order right. to do this. And so there are probably parts of this that you want to focus on. And I wonder if it is more geoform than substrate. I mean, I can't imagine that we need guidance on what sand, if we're using Wentworth, you know, or we're using the a, a, a ternary diagram. For, I mean, we're not going to second guess geology from 60 years ago that anybody doing this should actually be able to do. So is it really the geoform that's that's more of an issue than the substrate? I think from, you know, the stuff that I read on the habitat, certainly the substrate definitely has a lot more great recommendations and guidelines that we can use from the NOAA marine fisheries, also from our own guidelines with bone that they push. There's less, much less on the geoform. So, yeah, okay. So perhaps, perhaps the thanks for this. And I'll, Stacey, I'll, I'll shut up in a minute. But um, I, I guess I think that one thing that would strengthen this profile would be, and, and perhaps this is obvious to others, um, what you use substrate and geoform information for in your evaluations. Because I'm sensing that you, that you know you need this information to be better and more consistent but it's kind of value added to the program as a whole and how you would, how this would inform NEPA or EFH, which are the two things that you mentioned in the profile. That, that's the link I think that I'm missing, given that that, that link between whether it's sandy and whether anything lives there, there are so many uncertainties in, the, in that link that I'm, I'm kind of wondering why, the, why knowing whether it's muddy sand or sandy mud kind of really makes, that much difference when it's really that association of the habitat with the substrates that is probably uh, more uncertain. So, um, Stacey, I might have some other comments if there's time. Thank you. Yeah, I'll um, certainly be happy to, to come back to you, Denise. I want to give uh, Ryan Beamer an opportunity too, as one of our invited guests. I'm going to turn to him, Les, Kevin, and Lori. Hi, uh, 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 thank you for letting me participate. Uh, my name is Ryan Beamer. I'm a geotechnical engineer from the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth. Uh, I, I guess one of the things was just looking through everything in, into the previous. Uh, sorry, I am uh, actually calling in from Australia, so I'll turn my video on, but uh, I uh, just woke up, so <laughs> my hair may be a bit crazy. Uh, yeah, no, sorry, I'm uh, visiting the University of Melbourne, so I'm uh, uh, on the other side of the world. Uh, but I guess one of the thoughts looking through is it does look like this is highly geological, but a lot of the applications will be on the geotechnical side, especially on the nourishment and offshore energy. And the and I guess the comment kind of, oh, like, how do you classify a substrate? I'm sure many of the geologists, when I heard I'm a geotech, would probably say this person doesn't know how, we, how to classify anything because we do it completely different. And that could be another group that might be good in participating in something like this, especially when it comes to the industry side. Uh, you know, because you know, geotechs, we do not use the term mud. Mud does doesn't exist in our vocabulary. We also call offshore sediment soils, which I know irritates a lot of, of, of geologists, but will be, you know, on that when it comes to application, when it comes to industry, we will be heavily involved. So that could help with some of the I guess the difficulties and with the communication is getting that side and our standards, you know, act as part of this. Oh, thank you. I'll turn to Les, Kevin, and then Lori. Um, hi, Laura. That was a great presentation, but I, I just want to underscore what uh, Denise was talking about. Um, in terms of potential harm to biotic communities, biodiversity, or fisheries production, geoform is really the thing that matters. And the critical thing about it is that it's dynamic. Uh, two examples are the changes in silt layering on hard bottom between uh, summer and winter, 
And the other is the maturity of the benthic community, which is probably the most important parameter and one we know almost nothing about from a mapping standpoint. So the literature can help in understanding where there are knowledge gaps, but I'm still wondering how the study could be modified to address the knowledge gaps. It's a very, very valid point. I mean, <laughs> I don't disagree. And I think it's just an inch closer that we can, you know, one, one area you cover, you cover down and you characterize it and you just keep moving forward. I, I don't know if I can completely close that, that I don't disagree at all with what you just said. <laughs> and I wrote down all three points that you just made as well. So thanks. Thank you, Les. Kevin and Lori. Hi, thank you. Thank, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, the uh, so so kind of echoing what 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 Denise and, and Ryan uh, said, and also um, lest uh, so this is a, a presentation, or this is you're trying to almost create a, a glossary of, of common terms or a way of, of people uh, talking about these uh, together. I my my background is is benthic. Uh, ecology as well, along with with less, and and I'm familiar with the the work the Marine uh, Fisheries Service, and particularly the the New England Fisheries Management Council have done, and they've done some pretty extensive work on, um, which will relate to the next presentation too, on dredging and and substrate uh, type and formation as it affects fisheries and and essential fish habitat. So there's quite a huge volume of work that 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 has been done that I would know that if that's the way you're wanting this to go, you should really link in with that that group, I think. So definitely not leaning towards developing new glossaries. Use all that existing in the, in the thing. I think it's the where you start working in those, those grayer areas where we're looking at and really the methods and how they interpret it crossover. And again, there is a substantial much more on the substrate side over the geoform for sure and just leverage that and so the guidance documents could just genuinely point to some critical ones that would just lay it out um, but there doesn't seem to be a ton on the geoform for sure and and the geo geoform um because each of these wind farm companies are doing their own um geological surveys right and the side Correct. scan sonar and, and everything are, are you thinking of incorporating that data into this that is exactly one of the niches that would be beneficial we point to it a lot in our habitat and our fishery inside but i think also incorporating some of those components with the geog gng type guidelines would be beneficial again trying to make that point about the engineering components and how people are describing things they are very different but trying to figure out how to make that together and have a baseline understanding. And, and so uh, what, what, if I may, one more, in a baseline, um, because these, these proposals, they're all going to be adding scouring, the, you know, not only the, 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 the turbines with scouring and then the, 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 the dredging of um, uh, sediment for cables and either uh, covering with that. So that's, are you thinking of it as an actual uh, category that will be used to statistically compare the the variations in in substrate? I wouldn't rule it out. Yeah, yeah. and certainly we've seen the scouring from our own dredging projects with sand and gravel for sure. Yeah. yeah. So perhaps in your proposal, you might want to emphasize that a bit because once. Once these are in, it's it's a permanent change. And so this is the last chance to document that before. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, Lori, we'll turn to you next. So thanks, Laura. That's, and this has been an interesting discussion. And um, I think what I was, was thinking about echoes a lot of what the comments have already been, but what, what uh, what constitutes success for you? So how do you know when you've done enough, but you haven't, you know, really overworked the issues? Um, 
I can honestly say as a, the person that's catching all the data, nothing's ever the same when it comes at us. So I feel like if I could just minimize that a little bit would be successful, you know, and, and obviously we're all in this room where we're all cut data that doesn't look and smell the same right. And so I think we can just approve that just a little bit <laughs> to make all of our lives a little easier. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful discussion to start our um, consideration of profiles today. I just want to reiterate for folks on the line um, and those in the room, but uh, particularly our invited guests that are joining us virtually, that if you don't have an opportunity to share all of your thoughts, if you have any additional uh, feedback or input, please don't hesitate to um, send that to me. I can make sure it gets channeled to the correct people. So uh, really appreciate your time and, and joining us. Um, and a special shout out to both uh, Denise and Ryan. Denise joining us as a former member and Ryan joining us from halfway across the world. So uh, really appreciate the, the input. Uh, we will move now to our next uh, profile presentation by Dina Hansen, looking at extrapolating benthic recovery estimates beyond single project constraints. Dina, I'll turn it over to you if you're ready. Okay, great. Thanks, Stacey. Uh, my name is Dina Hansen. I'm a marine scientist with the Marine Minerals Program. Um, I really appreciate the, the attention that each member has given yesterday into today. Um, it's very special for us to be able to tap into all these different perspectives um, in one sitting. Uh, okay, so we'll go to the next slide, jump right in here. Um, so I'm going to just give some background. I'm going to follow the same format as everyone else. Um, so one of the things that is probably not new to anyone in the room is that dredging removes benthic invertebrates. Um, this is one of the most direct impacts of dredging that we see. Um, and then the invertebrates recolonize. There's usually a pattern to this. Um, this has been monitored for specific dredge projects um, in a variety of different areas. Um, sometimes it is um, different time periods, different spatial scales. Uh, there is, but there is a lot of data out there. Um, not every area is monitored again or over um, the same amount of time. So there is quite a bit of variability in the monitoring methods. Um, so just reading through some of the um, other literature, I did find um, a paper by um, uh, Dr. Hidenk who um, did a model of recovery following fishing fish trawls. Um, so he was able to come up with a model that he did a um, collected data from all over the world and was able to do um, use these different studies to look at generalized estimates of recovery. Um, so you can see that this calculation here, um, which they used the relative abundance relative to a carrying capacity, um, and then that's dependent on fit, um, trawl frequency and both depletion and recovery rates. So if um, in his paper, um, F, D and R were calculated using data inputs, and then we were able to get an estimate of that ratio that um, represents kind of that recovery. Uh, so this, so looking at this formula, um, I thought, you know, we have all this dread, all this benthic monitoring data. Could we basically um, go through the same process, the same method, and come up with a um, formula that is unique to dredge, uh, you know, dredge activity and recovery? Next slide, please. And so kind of focusing in on um, our, the BOEM information need is to, you know, again, take that uh, formula that was adapted to fish, um, fish trawls and use it for dredge impacts. Um, this would improve our benthic impact assessments. This is particularly important um, as we are seeing larger projects um, and more along the coast. So there's a spatial and regional context that um, hasn't been um, fully explored, as well as a temporal context where sometimes we'll see dredging happen um, successively in a way that um, we haven't previously seen. And in that way, sort of those cumulative impacts um, are becoming more important. Um, the field monitoring, so that even though we have a huge amount of data, it does not necessarily occur for every project. And so a lot of times we're left kind of inferring recovery rates based on either past monitoring or from monitoring um, done for a different project. 
uh, and we often have very generalized estimates. So, you know, within X months, we'll see um, an increase in maybe abundance of biomass. And then within X years, we might see a full recovery of community composition. This doesn't always take into account the full operational parameters, meaning how long is dredging occurring? What season is it occurring in? What's the dredge cut depth, which is how deep they, they dredge from the seabed? Um, or other, you know, environmental factors of, um, you know, current seasonality, things like that. Um, and so, as I mentioned, the regional and cumulative effects um, beyond single projects are also um, less understood. And we'll go to the next slide, please. And so, um, the, I, the idea for this project is to take that formula that focused on fish trawling and adapt it to dredge um, dredge projects. So our study would basically develop the those input parameters, um, and then we would receive sort of an estimate of recovery, which is that B over K factor. Um, this formula could then be used for those, uh, you know, for all those projects where there is not benthic monitoring executed. Uh, if we have successive dredge events and we need to do something in between each dredge event to better understand what the impact is. Um, and if there is are changes in available undisturbed habitat, which are often kind of used to recolonize a dredge area. Um, so I think this could be something that we would use in a couple different um, uh, scenarios. Next slide, please. And so um, the methods would, um, First of all, collate as much data as we as we can. So review um, not just the raw data, but also um, other studies that have been done um, throughout the, the United States. We could, you know, also look abroad internationally and um, integrate those results if, if possible. Uh, calculate those input parameters in order to create that recovery rate, um, and then also you would integrate environmental variables as covariates in order to see which um, environmental factors are significant and contribute to recovery rate. Um, and then the kind of end product would be um, an interface, I'm, nothing that needs to be um, hosted online, but something like a spreadsheet, um, but that has a, a very clear manual where um, any BOEM analyst could go in, um, you'd be walked through, you know, how to, um, how to find your input parameters so that you could um, um, create a uh, kind of recovery rate estimate. And, and this could be used, you know, we're, this is, you know, geared toward the marine minerals program, but I could see certainly application in other areas, including kind of cable laying activities for wind energy or pipeline placement. Um, you know, I think that's, there's the potential for it to be extrapolated to other program areas. And last slide. So these are our um, kind of research questions that drove the, the study idea. How does the recovery of biomass vary with dredge frequency? Um, and that dredge frequency can kind of be um, interpreted a, a couple of different ways, but in this case, we're kind of thinking more of those successive dredge events. Um, what are the estimates range and dimensions of benthic recovery at different dredge depths and frequencies? And then how do successive events um, cumulative, cumulatively affect um, benthic recovery. Last slide. Oh, that's the last slide. So we can, I think, maybe go back to the research questions if that helps. Um, but one thing I did want to specifically call out as we go into our discussion, um, Jeff Reidenauer mentioned that this study has been on um, kind of on our list for several years. This is the third round that it's been submitted. And um, it hasn't made the cut. It hasn't kind of reached that higher priority um, of, of getting to the you know, final NSL and funding. And so what I would I would love to hear feedback from um, is what, you know, what can is this a priority? You know, I'd love, I, I'm kind of like in the weeds here. So I'd I'd kind of love to hear how do we make this a priority? What needs to be, does something need to be added? How do we make this more applicable or compelling? such that it is more kind of competitive among our kind of studies pool of great ideas. Um, to me, there is a lot of science available that we aren't using to like its best, um, 
we're not access, accessing it in the best way. Um, so for me, the, this would help get us to that best available science use. Um, so I would, I would love any feedback specifically on kind of the con more like the concept and how to make this uh, a more, um, yeah, more competitive and, and kind of get past that hurdle of um, getting funding for this year. <laughs> thanks, Dina. Uh, I see Katrine has her hand raised. I'll go to you first. Yeah, thanks, Dina. I, uh, I really appreciated your uh, presentation here and also the, the question at the end. Um, I, uh, I think you provided a little bit more information than was in the written um, profile, and that was really good. Um, I think there are, for me, at least uh, a number of questions. Uh, first off, I think this could be a, a very useful idea to add to uh, other forms of information uh, that need to be collected for this. So when I read the profile, I was a little concerned that this would be like, okay, so then we have this model and then we only need to one click for the in the in the app uh, and then we have all the information we need. And I think I, I would caution in terms of projecting that idea. I think this could be very useful additional information, but I don't think it really replaces everything else that still also needs to be done. Um, you, you mentioned in your presentation that um, there are a, a whole bunch of uh, data sources available for this. And that was actually one of my questions that um, what was listed wasn't an entirely clear of how much you know, data is actually there um, to both inform the model and then test the model. And um, so I think uh, being a bit more convincing about that you indeed have a very large database to, to, to put this into effect is would be really useful. Uh, it might also be useful to explain more how you would um, calculate some of the input parameters, uh, particularly R, um, because one of the things that the model does, it only looks at biomass, it does not look at diversity, it does not look at identity of the, of the um, invertebrates. And while that is um, for the model, maybe what you need to do, R, of course, would also be influenced by who is actually <laughs> at play there, you know, I mean, reproductive rates um, or immigration through uh, mobile species versus sessile species, all these kind of things. You lose that if you, if you don't look at the identity of, of things. Um, so some of these either uh, biodiversity metrics or trait metrics would be probably good to uh, have that information uh, to put into the model. And then one last thing is, so what is, when you calculate your um, biomass to capacity ratio, what would you feel is acceptable as a, this is recovered versus it is not recovered, right? It's, it, it goes from zero to one. <laughs> so is it, is it one or is it 0 0.9 and, and why? Uh, so I right. think there would be more, detail that would be needed to sort of solidify what this what this model can give you in addition. Yep, so um, for the one, it, so for your point about the community composition, um, rather than purely biomass or abundance, um, the, the paper that focused on fish trawling said that I think it is possible to build in that community um, diversity if the data allows. So that's something that we would have to dig into our data set and see if there's enough there to, to build that in. But I think it is possible. Um, uh, and, and yeah, and perhaps that might, we might have two different R values depending on whether it's purely biomass or if it's community composition, we likely would have different R values. Um, and then as far as deciding what is our acceptable recovery ratio, um, I don't have an answer for that. I know in the fish trawl paper, they used 0.95. So like basically 0.95 of the carrying capacity. So kind of a 95%. Um, is, but I think there is an argument for considering different values and, and realizing what does that mean for if we're approving the next dredge project, if we're only at 50% versus 90%. Um, and those are conversations that we have to have because we, we don't right now, because we don't have these quantitative 
estimates to, to build off of. But thank you for the excellent feedback. Thank you. I'll turn to Les next and then to Kevin. Last week. I, have a sticky, I have a sticky mute button. <laughs> hey, Dina. Um, <coughs> well, <coughs> I'm actually a big fan of this, but um, for, you know, building on the comments we already heard, the parameters that may really matter and that are frequently overlooked, aside from biodiversity, uh, aside from biomass, are not just biodiversity, but functional structure uh organic carbon and um the biogenic structure so not just what all the guys are and what they're doing not just how much of them there is collectively uh but also how much organic carbon is being deposited by the community because that's a that's a store that builds up and then how much biogenic structure there is because that's critical to fishery production, among other things. And there are such data in a few studies, maybe enough to nourish a model. But I just wanted to generally support the effort, but those things are critical. Biomass may actually be relatively insensitive. Thanks. Right. And in the um, fishing model, again, I keep going back to it because that's what, you know, <laughs> is sort of the inspiration. But in the fishing model, um, they did find that um, sort of the percentage of gravel as well as primary productivity were two very important factors in it for that particular model. So um, keeping these in mind would be, uh, you know, keeping these in mind for like factors to feed into a per, you know, potential dredge model, um, but the, the structure and the carbon yeah, I, I just want to underscore that uh, because these things are so frequently overlooked, except by benthic geeks like Kevin or me, um, the result is that we are massively transforming the continental shelf without being aware of it. Thank you. We'll turn next, I Thank think, you, to Les. Kevin. Thanks. Yeah. Yes, Father. Oh, folks. Could you use your mic, please? Oh, thank you very much. Thanks. Following up on what I what Les Les said as a benthic geek, um, the yeah, it uh, I mean, the, the, it, it, it's a really interesting uh, proposal that you put forward. I think um, to make it a little more competitive, I, I do think you should tie in with uh, even more so than the last presentation with the the marine. The, the New England Fisheries Management Council's efforts and their Habitat Omnibus, they have uh, worked years to develop a, a what they call a SASE model, which is a, a swept area impact model, and it includes habitat mapping, fisheries uh, gear vulnerability, uh, and it's also a, a spatially discrete model, so it, it, it's fairly useful that way, and I think it's being developed for, for um, the Alaskan coast as well as, as, as off our uh, off off the eastern seaboard here, um, the you know uh, carrying capacity is a really hard one to get a handle on, especially I and mean, with our coast, most of the area is is disturbed. You're not really going to find any uh, uh, unique habitat that is is unfished or un you know doesn't have, and and that model will help help point that with. So it's it's going to be hard to define uh, carrying capacity, uh, and so that might be one of the problems that you're 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 struggling with in in the reviews as well it's a, it's a it conceptually sounds like you could do it but it's it's in practice it's very hard to do and it's also um very hard hard to find the other uh component i wanted to mention is that uh these these um, m many of these substrats are, are dynamic and to not have a a, a component of of uh, current and, and benthic boundary layer and shifts it, it is going to limit your ability, I think, to, um, and, and so making that, thinking about that and trying to incorporate that in some way will make it more competitive, I believe. Great, thank you so much. Kevin, you want to 
Scott. Yeah, th th thanks for uh, a very informative presentation. It really did uh, add to the the, uh, the text, uh, and, and uh, much obliged for that. I, I you, you also shared your your uh, struggle to. Uh, so I, you said, I think this is the third time around for this pre, this proposal and your challenge getting uh, uh, getting it competitive for funding. Have you reached out to uh, other potential partners? I'm just thinking folks like the Army Corps of Engineers or some of the states that uh, help both of who would be partners in managing some of these projects uh, to see if they might uh, also have interest with you in, in making this come about. So the Army Corps was certainly... Um would be our one of our data um, repositories. So they have they actually fund more benthic monitoring um, than BOEM does. So I think they would be um, a data partner. But I have not um, asked about funding. You know, actually funding some of this. So that's a a very good potential kind of leverage there. Um, and I think for states, there's the potential. It's just harder to tap into. Um, those resources, especially because each state has their own monitoring plan, at least with the Army Corps, at least at the regional level, they do tend to follow similar monitoring protocols. But when you go state to state, they they don't always have the same um, methods, which is still, you know, I think that's still useful because you having variability in your benthic monitoring actually would help, I think, help strengthen the model because you're actually probably filling some of those different um, spatial and temporal um, uncertainties. So yeah, I think um, Army Corps could be a, a good you know, potential funding partner. Um, I'm a little leery about states, but I think it could be possible maybe if we had a state that did a lot of monitoring that they would be interested in a model like this. I'm not seeing any additional hands raised at the moment. Um, so, Dina, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, we will be breaking for lunch, uh, reconvening at 1.30 uh, to hear from the New Orleans office. So thank you each very much. Uh, again, for those in the room, committee members, we will have lunch provided outside. Friends from BOEM, I'm sorry we cannot feed you. <laughs> Um, but we will look forward to seeing folks back at 1.30 so we can get started on time. Thank you. Can I check? Can I check if people can hear me? This is Ari. We, we can, can hear you. It's a little bit loud in the room at the moment, um, but, so, but, but we can hear that you're there. Okay, thank you. All right, I think we've got most folks back in the room. Um, so we will go ahead and get the meeting underway again. And I appreciate um, those that are back um, being here timely. So uh, the next thing that we will hear is the introduction to the New Orleans office profiles. And we have Ari Keller on the line to introduce those. So Ari, I will turn it over to you. Thanks for joining us. Hey. 
thanks. Sorry I cannot make it um, in person. It's been a while since I've seen many of you, but uh, hopefully next time. Um, I am Ari Keller. I am the Regional Supervisor of the Office of Environment for New Orleans. I'm also acting as the Environmental Studies and Outreach Coordinator Section Manager. Just to put a plug in, that position announcement is closing today if anyone's interested. Um, so I'll go ahead and get started. The last 50 years of ESP has allowed our agency to be the lead on diverse research in the Gulf of Mexico for both the marine and human environments. It has also allowed us now to revisit what we've done and plan for our future activities. As I mentioned last year, offshore wind was on its way to the Gulf of Mexico. We are now working towards a leasing event this year. We are also working closely with many offices in BOEM on the carbon sequestration rule with the idea that leasing and activities potentially would start in the Gulf of Mexico. All of this while oil and gas and marine mineral related activities continue. Last year, our national studies list had studies that started looking at impacts of offshore wind, better defining our cultural resources and updating and sharing the data we have on the benthic communities in the Gulf of Mexico. This studies development plan process has produced several studies for the Gulf of Mexico management to consider during our national studies list process. There are studies that are continuing, su supplementing and focusing previous research. Um, there are also ones to better understand impact producing factors caused by offshore wind and carbon sequestration for the Gulf, as well as recognizing the need to better understand the impacts of four potential programs in the Gulf of Mexico. That's offshore wind, marine minerals, um, oil and gas, and carbon sequestration, and what these impacts could do to our communities. Today, you will hear about the profile Gulf Coast Community and Cultural Impact Baseline Surveys. I'll let Dustin and Scott get into the details, but the intent of this study is to collect baseline data sets in multiple Gulf of Mexico communities prior to the ramp up of these new acti activities in the region so that future comparisons between baseline and current conditions can be made. So with that, and if there are no questions for me, I will pass it along to Dustin and Scott because I know this is a very interesting and interested for COSA um, profile. Thank you so much, Ari. I'm going to take a quick look to see if there's any questions either online or in the room for Ari before we jump to the profile. Excellent. I don't see any. Um, so with that, we'll hear from uh, Scott and Dustin about the Gulf Coast Community Cultural Impact Baseline Survey. Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining. Yes. Um, so I'll start us off today. I want to thank COSA for looking over this and providing feedback. Uh, next slide, please. Um, just a little bit of background for where we're coming from onshore impacts. Um, you know, what happens with these wind and upcoming technologies is going to be informed by our legacy programs, namely oil and gas. Um, the turn of the 20th century is really when oil and gas starts in the region. It moves into the marshlands in the late 20s and early 30s, and the first offshore well was in 1947 south of Morgan City. Um, and today we're at over uh, 2,000 active leases, 12 million acres. Um, and what we call the oil and gas industry is somewhat of a misnomer when we're thinking about onshore impacts. It's really many uh, upstream, midstream, downstream industries, boat fabrication, uh, pipeline fabrication, co coating, ports, service industries. Um, and these are all responding to their own markets and relationships um, and historical trends. Um, so when we're thinking about the onshore impacts, you know, it's really this um, ecosystem of different industries. And now with wind and other technologies moving in, we um, suspect that they're going to build off of these existing industries, but in new ways. And um, similar to oil and gas, it's not going to be necessarily a renewable industry, um, but it will be businesses 
in uh, many different industries, building off of oil and gas, um, laying the groundwork for new businesses. Um, and so when we're thinking about these upcoming technologies, um, they're gonna, it's going to be important not only to understand baseline and existing cumulative stressors uh, for these technologies, but in turn, these new technologies are going to change the way in which we do um, analysis from a social science perspective uh, to legacy programs like oil and gas, because uh, they will produce cumulative impacts on these legacy programs. Next slide. Thank you, Dustin. Um, you know, I was really struck by some of Bill Brown's comments and Rodney's comments the other day to the committee, and I, I recognized how much of a focus this study really is for BOEM. And it, it makes me appreciate that, you know, I was here for the birth of BOEM um, and how it kind of emerged and shed its skin kind of from what it was when it was Minerals Management Service um, and how it really built itself uh, very intentionally to become a premier ocean science agency. You know, uh, constant change would probably be the theme that I would pick for it as an agency. Um, I think we saw it first when the Marine Minerals Program really expanded and grew, which you may have noticed from some of the other presentations. Um, we now have viable offshore wind in the Atlantic. And now we're emerging with carbon sequestration and green hydrogen as, as sort of new initiatives. Now, I personally find carbon sequestration kind of fascinating, um, you know, and, and it's part of BOEM's mission as the nation takes a, you know, a very broad and multilateral approach to addressing factors contributing to climate change that, that we're all facing. Um, so carbon sequestration and its uh, transport is inherently similar to oil and gas, but kind of in reverse. Um, however, the risks and effects have not really been characterized and in many cases are, are likely different than what we saw for oil and gas. So we need new, you know, or recent or quality data to really develop scenario information that would help us in assessing potential impacts. You know, we, we, we also need to understand that in many cases, uh, these new facilities or uh, rehab facilities might co-mingle in locations where environmental justice communities also exist. Um, so, you know, thinking in this way, oil and gas is produced on the OCS. It often co-mingles with oil and gas produced from other domestic sources like state waters, public, private lands, etc. cetera. Um, and it, it does this before reaching a plethora of mid and downstream facilities by a bunch of different means. Um, it's vast and it's a complex web of interrelated industries and uh, associated infrastructure make it very difficult to uh, attribute indirect and cumulative impacts to a source and activity that's nearly impossible to identify the direct effects of a specific activity uh, of to the communities that we're concerned of. Now with CCC, CCS or carbon sequestration, upstream and downstream are essentially reversed. And so we may, in this instance, even know perhaps what facilities they're actually coming from. And this could include air emissions, hazard potentials, past accidents from, from other facilities that they're coming from, and maybe even the demographic characteristics around those facilities. So it, you know, it brings a whole new list of questions to us, which is very exciting. Like, will new infrastructure reuse old facilities or sites? If, if the facilities are required, how will the planning be conducted and what states and agencies might be involved in all that? Um, all of these answers could potentially affect our own analyses and affect determinations. And this requires a completely different focus uh, in terms of data needs than what we've had uh, in the traditional oil and gas program. Next slide, please. Uh, in a similar light, you know, and, and also in my own ignorance, I had come out of this assuming green hydrogen was simply about providing energy. Um, and the more I've been exposed to the industrial uses of hydrogen, the more my understanding of the potential benefits and challenges has really expanded. Um, green hydrogen is not just a novel technology, but also has downstream effects in the coastal industrial uses, uh, mostly 
uh, focused around Louisiana and, and Texas, it would, it, um, we think. So Corpus Christi, for example, uh, in Texas, I just learned is a finalist location for the upcoming uh, DOE Regional Clean Hydrogen Hubs Program. Um, you know, green hydrogen is a completely different um, in terms of potential hazards, environmental risks, what even the onshore facilities would look like, where the product goes, um, what the energy sources for hydrogen production will end up being, uh, how it'll be transported. Th these are all things that, you know, we really don't fully understand or know yet, but green hydrogen production, we do know would require substantial sources of fresh water. And given Corpus Christi, for example, again, you know, it's in the midst of a multi-year drought. So production of green hydrogen may consequentially require significant infrastructure investment in things like desalination plants. Uh, that too would, I assume, preferably be powered by offshore wind. Um, and I know there is some limited early experimentation of running desalination completely offshore, but that specific technology has not really been proven viable as of yet. Next slide. Dustin, you're muted, I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, I was, this slide is uh, the current timeline for wind projects alongside a sort of an example of what a study development process might look like all the way through. Um, and this is just to show the sort of timelines that we're looking at for um, traditional studies developments, um, assuming that it's a study that only takes two years of field work. Um, some take more, some take less. Uh, you're looking for about seven years from when you begin developing that study profile to when the final reports publish. Um, we're about to have our first auction for wind uh, in September um, ish. And um, you can see the sort of timeline. You know, once that auction happens, we have at most six years before. Um, the cop the the construction and operations plan is complete um so if we want baseline data before then um the time is is essentially now and might already be passed um but from experience on working with um, projects in the atlantic um you might not even know some of those onshore components until near the very end of the cop stage and that includes things like potential ports um transmission corridors and things like that um so if you want to be able to respond to those quickly um it, it's it can be difficult um under our current timeline next slide please um so you know S S scott will get a little bit more into the way that this is structured which is really um a contracting um structure um but these contracts could take the form of um surveys or or ethnographic field research um looking at things such as fishery subsistence practices um of which boehm actually just published one of the first large studies in the lower 48 this year um air quality and environmental justice issues uh view shed issues um archaeological and other cultural resources um existing cumulative burdens, um, which has been especially stressed in the new executive order um, for environmental justice, 14096. Um, and in these study areas, these might look like um, infrastructure, uh, economic challenges, impact of hurricane, land loss in coastal areas, um, et cetera. Um, and not only uh, can these on the ground studies help with our NEPA analysis, um, but they can also lay the groundwork for, um, you know, uh, relationship building with communities to better bolster our outreach efforts. Um, really at this stage, I think where we're at, um, we don't know what we don't know. And, um, and in part, that'll have to be answered by um, doing field work. Um, so, you know, these, studies are kind of positioned at understanding who's there 
um, who should we be talking to, what are they concerned about, um, and then start thinking through um, possibly mitigation strategies and, th and things like that. Next slide, please. Um, just to show sort of some geographical footprints, um, unlike oil and gas for renewables and other upcoming technologies, um, these projects have discrete footprints on shore. Um, and so we're able to better target geographically um, where these onshore impacts will be. Currently with the wind energy areas, we're looking at the um, Texas-Louisiana border and the Galveston area. Um, uh, the Gulf of Mexico Social Studies, Social Science Studies Program um, really got going in the late 90s. Um, and for these geographic areas, um, some of those studies that came out of that initial push um, are the only studies that BOEM has uh, for these geographies, um, excepting a more recent one in, in Port Arthur um, from 2014. Um, so, um, you know, these are information gaps for us, um, especially in that Lake Charles, that Calcasieu, Cameron Parish area. Uh, we know that um, Hurricane Laura had tremendous impacts of which people are still recovering from. Um, and so we really, um, we need more information about these geographies. Next slide. Uh, Dr. Chilena Wren is one of our premier air quality experts in the Gulf of Mexico region and has stressed the importance of modeling through her various past studies and efforts, uh, one of which awesomely provided us with our own mobile air quality monitoring station um, now, I, I'm not pretending to even be remotely capable to speak on uh, the science of air quality, but I can appreciate how necessary it is when performing uh, direct or cumulative impact analyses among others uh, for NEPA, Clean Air Act, and so on. Now, uh, coastal communities adjacent to these call areas um, or adjacent to port and support facilities uh, include the Houston Galveston Brazoria area, for an example, um, which is also in a non attainment status for the eight hour ozone national ambient air quality standards. Um, so the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act uh, requires compliance with these uh, standards pursuant to the Clean Air Act um, to the extent that these activities uh, under OSLA significantly affect the quality of air in any state. Um, a lot of social analyses uh, necessarily tier from analyses in other disciplines, just like air quality, meaning that analyses such as uh, environmental justice are inherently multidisciplinary with information on air quality, water quality, the effects on biological resources, effects to fisheries, and, and these all directly affect the human dimension and influence the behaviors and preferences of human populations. Um, and without critical baseline information on what the air quality is now, I, I honestly don't know how we'd be able to meaningfully measure the changes in effects or positive or negative from offshore wind or carbon sequestration. Next slide, please. Um, this profile is proposing something that's, that's maybe not as usual um, for our studies program. It, it's actually proposing a multi-award or even a single award indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity sort of contract, either as a cooperative agreement akin to the Coastal Marine Institute program at LSU or as an agreement uh, as a contract vehicle with an overall award cap of $5 million. Now, this doesn't mean that studies will have to show up with $5 million at the, the start of this. What it means is it's an overall cap uh, on, on which you can then issue task orders under with it. Um, so subsequent task orders could be presented like mini profiles or, or go through a different approval process. And our hope is that we'd be able to rapidly issue these in the call areas as the scenarios and locations of new activities are emerging. Um, you know, this is going to help us greatly with our NEPA responsibilities, Clean Air Act, National Historic Preservation Act, and so on. So, um, you know, just to kind of highlight this, you know, over the past 
five years, uh, we have funded 436 studies, uh, which I think is a staggering number when you look at it from that perspective. So kudos to Bohm. Um, the average cost uh, was roughly $310,000. Uh, we historically have used uh, what I would consider a scalpel-like approach. And I think that the concerns from the internal review process of this profile uh, was that the overall task proposed was so broad to allow for the dynamic nature of new technologies emerging in the Gulf, a broad geographic area, but a study of this scale could be viewed as a much higher risk to the agency overall and lacking specificity, you know, in direction or execution at this early stage. Um, BOEM is highly risk averse in its procurements typically and, and tends to use the firm fixed price contract vehicle as its, its vehicle of choice, just simply because it puts most of the risk on the contractor themselves. Scott and so, Dustin, I'm going to just ask you if you don't mind to, to start to wrap it up so that we can stay as much on time as possible for the remainder of the afternoon. Yes, uh, that transitions to the last slide, which is actually the list of questions for COSA. So I would love uh, to hear your feedback and, and Dustin and I will be standing by to um, get your insight and help in this. Thank you. We'll open for questions. Rona? Hi, thanks for uh, your presentation. And I agree with you on the importance of, uh, of this approach. Um, I also agree with the concerns raised that you mentioned during the internal review uh, in terms of the scope and the specificity. Um, I think that there are probably ways to um, to focus the scope and to make it more specific, even given the very broad nature um, of the mandate. And I would encourage you to drill down into that. And one of the, um, the things that I noticed is in your slide that shows the social vulnerability uh, piece. And you were saying that the most recent data that you have are either from the 90s or from the mid teens. Um, I would direct you to the 2020 census data uh, which have extremely detailed social vulnerability information um, that's very relevant to this area. And one of the big improvements in the 2020 census was that they had um, uh, uh, the, they, uh, they invited state recognized but not federally recognized tribal groups um, to provide uh, maps um, and demographic information that helped include that additional component. So there's a lot of richness there. Um, that could really help you refine uh, some of your goals. And I think that's important in terms of your procurement aims because really the quality that you put in, in terms of how you direct those is uh, a measure of the quality you'll get out. So, um, so I, I think this is wonderful, but I, I do think it needs a lot of work. Thank you, Rona. We'll go to um, Kevin, Jeremy, and then Rod. Hi, uh, thank you very much for, for the presentation. It's a, it's a, it's a, a, a massive scope, and and given that, uh, I would suggest uh, that you guys uh, take a close look at the the report, uh, the the first in class report. I know that we, I was on that committee, and we constructed that uh, for for Bohm in itself, but it can be, it can also be used for for. Uh, focusing in on particular um, studies like this, which are, are 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 more than just a single study, but but are are, are um, you know a collection of, of studies and analysis, because I think that the attributes within that would would help you focus your your proposal quite a bit, and also put it in line with uh, uh, with with uh, uh, Bohm's um, over overall intent. So that that would be my suggestion to take a take a close look at that document. I, I know for myself, I found it extremely useful and, and I think it, it might help quite a bit. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Um, I'm going to um, go to Jeremy next and then we have one of our invited guests on the line. So I'm gonna go to uh, Jeremy, Vanessa, and then Rod and Scott. Uh, good afternoon and thank you for the presentation. Um, a couple of comments. Uh, one, I, I think it's too late for a baseline. So you, I, I think you should come up with some other uh, 
term for what you're doing. Um, I mean, as you said, oil and gas has been in since 47. The whole area has been developed, I mean, at large, large industrial scale. Uh, Lake Charles, you, you talked about it, it's an EJ community uh, given uh, all the, the ONG development, the oil refineries, um, it's not baseline, it, it's sub baseline. And, and uh, so I, I, I think you really need to, to, to think about whether you're, you're too late. It also seems perhaps too diffuse. You've got, I think, too many communities. Um, I, I was, you know, I, I would also suggest that you go and really get in, uh, deep down with the literature. Maybe you have, but there was no literature cited in the in the profile, so I couldn't tell what literature you're you're relying on uh, to develop this uh, to develop this study. And lastly, I would say um, you should look and see what comes out of the the DOE social science call. Uh, there's a focus on community impacts. Uh, we don't yet know what's going to come out of it, but it's certainly possible that uh, some researchers may be focusing on uh, on the Gulf. Um, and so some of that work that you're interested may be potentially funded. Uh, so I, I would say coordinate with, with, with DOE. Um, thank you. Yeah, I appreciate those comments. Thank you very much. Um, you know, what my overarching kind of response is maybe that, uh, you know, a lot of times environmental documents have a lot of negative effects that are listed, right? Effects to biological resources, effects to benthic habitats, effects to archaeological resources, and so on. What's great about our economists and social scientists is that sometimes we're the only bit of good news, right? We're going to add jobs. We're going to add employment. We're going to improve uh, retraining in the region. We're going to have, uh, you know, uh, improvements in air quality by doing carbon capture and switching to renewable sources. But how can we report those back and and those findings if if we can't measure where we're at now? Yeah, I, I think measuring it where you are now. It's just I I think the term baseline is. Uh, just is not applicable to the region. Thank you. We'll go to uh, Vanessa and then Rod, Scott, and um, I'm sorry, Dipanja, Dipanjana. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. Vanessa, go ahead. I'm sorry, Vanessa, you're muted. That's horrible. Thank I'm you. so sorry. 2023. All right, I'm Vanessa Parks. I'm a sociologist. Thank you so much for having me, Dustin, Scott. It's great to meet you. Great to hear about this project. Um, I want to jump off a little bit uh, from what Jeremy was just talking about. And my, as a sociologist, my big picture comments here are about incorporating community voices. So not just air quality data, but um, in, engaging with these communities. Um, so I'll start by saying social vulnerability indices are a uh, great way for identifying areas of potential concern, um, but statistically they wash out important heterogeneity in that area. Um, if there are particular communities that you're interested in, um, I would recommend identifying them and targeting them specifically. Um, so maybe that is a, a, a targeted approach, maybe you take a more qualitative approach, um, and to think about impacts that aren't just air quality, but also uh, worry about their health, uh, trust in information sources or uh, biometric health information. Um, and a, a question that I'll leave y'all with, because I was waiting to hear a little bit about this, but how can the findings from your proposed work be used for future planning and, and how do you anticipate this work being used in the future? Thank you, Dustin or Scott, would you like to respond to that at all? Yeah, I'll take a crack at it. Um, you know, we've also struggled with using American Community Survey data. Um, we found that in rural areas in the Gulf, um, the data quality is extremely low. 
um, even at the census designated place level, oftentimes the margin of error um, is just as high as their total population, for instance, um, in some of these communities we're concerned about. Um, so that means any social vulnerability indices and other, you know, combined uh, measurements, um, they're hard to rely on. Um, so that's absolutely something uh, we're worried about, but we also have a good history of funding um, ethnographic qualitative studies throughout the region. Um, and um, we have a good history of that, especially some of our post Deepwater Horizon studies were um, instrumental um, in the subsequent litigation. And um, how it'll be used in the future, um, you know, one of the problems we have with oil and gas is that BOEM has unique information needs to be able to do their NEPA analysis that's not oftentimes aligned with maybe what academics are collecting. Um, and so, you know, going back to this idea of oil and gas has been here for over 100 years. Um, it's deeply in, entwined throughout the region and it's diffused throughout the region. Um, and so I think we've always struggled some with doing kind of traditional social impact assessments. Um, so we see wind and other upcoming technologies because they have these sort of discrete project footprints. Um, it's almost like an opportunity to, to, to start that. And so we're hoping that, um, you know, these would be done before the majority of activities related to wind start taking place. And then we can come back in 10 years in 20 years um, and see, you know, what happened, what changed. Um, we just finished a, um, a diachronic study of the Deepwater Horizon revisiting several communities that were visited just after the spill. Um, and that was interesting to see how people's ideas of the spill changed over five, 10 years. Um, so probably something similar to what had been done there. Thank you. Vanessa, Thank you. if you don't have additional thoughts, I'll turn next to Rob. So uh, thanks, Dustin and Scott. Um, clearly, um, given the new responsibilities and the development of renewables in the Gulf, um, but it needs to um, get more detailed and accurate data. I can see how this would um, inform and enhance the cumulative impacts and the social factors sections of your NEPA and your environmental justice work. I also agree that this has to be started as soon as possible and ahead of time. That seems to be some of the lessons learned of the previous technologies um, and processes in the Gulf. Um, so I think the need is um, clearly demonstrated. I think the questions are about the scale, the scope, the methods, uh, and the processes here. It seems that this is so big that it needs definition, but it also needs flexibility. So I think that what Boehm needs is ways in which the data obtained early can inform and help structure the subsequent parts of this. Um, and if that can be done through this indefinite delivery, indefinite quality model, then all well and good. If not, then I think it needs to be broken down into more manageable parts through a sequence of profiles uh, and studies. And so I think it's probably up to you and the leadership in the, in the program to figure out the best way to do that, such that the information is useful to you and that you can define it and yet also have the flexibility to shape the process going forward and I don't know how that is best done but I, I do see the need and the urgent need but also um, the the need to be able to to have this as an iterative pro process that going forward yeah I don't think the agency wants to just hand us a blank check and say yeah we trust you go do whatever you want whatever you think you need and so really getting the, the comments from COSA on this to help us sort of shape the direction, uh, the trajectory of what we're doing, um, 
is super helpful. So thank you. We'll take um, two more quick uh, comments and questions. Um, and I also just want to point out that there's been, I think, a very active chat going on. So this is, again, an example where we'll we'll try to capture that and, and get it to you all. Um, Scott, I'll turn to you next. And then um, Deepin Jana as well. Yeah, thank, thank you for this proposal. I, I, we had a good discussion yesterday, Rodney kind of teed it up about uh, some of the new frontiers that BOEM is moving into. And we talked about the fact that more and more we're talking about uh, potential spatial conflicts out here where BOEM wants to have more than one program active in the same geography. That's gonna be a continued challenge. It's an, it's an evolutionary process from the old days where we just had oil and gas and, and, uh, and, and sand projects to, to a new world where we're gonna have multiple programs that need to, to address the country's critical needs. And so I think this is, is a, you know, a step in the right direction. I would encourage you to think about maybe also narrowing the scope initially a little bit, maybe in an areas where uh, we, we can already see where some of those conflicts are already gonna come into play. One that comes to mind would be in Southeast Texas where you have wind leases leasing on, on the radar screen later this year. We know that uh, the state has leased acreage adjacent uh, to those, those uh, offshore areas for uh, carbon sequestration to Talos and Chevron has expressed interest in joining in that project. We also know that Exxon took huge leases in the OCS, uh, uh, which sure looked to me like they're targeting carbon sequestration. I could be wrong, but they would also be in the same place as the wind leases. So, um, you know, and, and you're gonna have your ongoing marine minerals activity, which is still gonna be end of interest out there. There's still some residual oil and gas. So this is a place where where uh, sorting, sorting out the cumulative impacts of all those different programs are, is gonna be important. Now, I'm gonna back up from that though and issue another, another challenge to Bohm on this. Um, I, I, I worry a little bit, we might be putting the cart before the horse here. Um, one of the challenges uh, we have with these the, the specific activities is what is, the, what is the most important use for that acreage, where is the biggest contribution going to be for the good of the country as a whole, not just the communities, but the country as a whole? Um, are we better served by uh, having uh, wind in offshore Southeast Texas, or are we better served by having carbon sequestration in what has been identified by some academic workers as the highest potential area for CCS storage in the OCS? And given that we're, you know, a National Academy report from 2019 suggested if we want to have any chance to get to uh, uh, car carbon zero uh, later this century, we probably need to be putting away about 150 uh, gigatons of CO2 uh, by 2050. Uh, the offshore Texas area is, is of quite a bit of interest. So somehow I think you need to weave into this a process by which you assess you know, what is, what is the highest value impact uh, to the nation's uh, uh, and the global uh, 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 environmental impacts um, of, of the acreage in question. So that's a, a, small, a small challenge for you, Rodney, but uh, uh, something, uh, something to keep on your radar screen as well. Thank you. Uh, and, uh, you know, thinking about that too, you know, there is a possibility, at least theoretical at this stage, that Bohm could endeavor to do co-located leasing. So I suspect that's going to be a real challenge to co-locate uh, high density wind farms and what looks to be, uh, if you're going to go for saline reservoirs in the offshore uh, coastal Texas, I suspect it's going to be all new development. It's not going to be realizing the existing oil and gas fields, but it'll be new, new wells, new pipelines, new injection infrastructure. Uh, and it may be very difficult to stick that in uh, in the midst of a wind farm. I'm, I could be wrong, but probably something the National Academies could help them look at. No, our resource evaluation team has been very active in trying to understand what this looks like from the industry standpoint and how the, that'll be executed. And all their early indications are that these will likely be new construction, new facilities, new pipelines specifically built for the purpose. Right. Thanks. We'll take one final comment on this profile. Um, we're uh, 
not quite 10 minutes behind schedule, but I want to keep us um, as on time as possible. So um, Deepanjana, we'll take one last comment from you. Hello. Uh, uh, this is a, I mean, uh, I also think that this project is quite, uh, the scope is very broad uh, and making us up parts will be uh, helpful. And uh, as regards the baseline is concerned, yes, it is. it should be called uh, the baseline for the study that is more appropriate. And uh, number three is I have noticed that uh, in this project, it has been proposed to uh, monitor the different chemical uh, compositions of NO, NO2, all uh, the, I, for the uh, positive time, I will call NOx, uh, NOx species. And we all know that uh, nitrogen is a major component uh, also for growth of the phytoplanktons and zooplanktons. So are you going to, if you can monitor that, uh, how the exchange of NOx is taking place between uh, air and also the marine water part, and uh, that can also help you in uh, understanding the how the carbon sequestration is taking uh, in the sea since you are covered trying to cover both the carbon capture storage which is now again picking up and also carbon sequestration thank you thank you and thank you dustin and scott for your presentation we'll turn next um to focusing on the Alaska Region Office profiles. Um, and I apologize, I don't have in front of me who is presenting for that. Give me just one moment. Oh, thank you, Eric. And Eric's here with us. Hi, Eric. <laughs> um, so I'll turn it over then to Eric. Uh, and then we'll, um, and you're doing the profile as well. Excellent. That's great. That's what we want. <laughs> I'll turn it over to you. All right. Sorry, can you turn your microphone on? Sorry. Thank you. Let me see. I'm all of you aware the Alaska Outer Continental Shelf is comprised of 15 planting areas. Um, there are two planting areas that have active leases. The Beaufort Sea has six active leases, and the Cook Inlet planting area has 15 active leases. To give you an idea of the scale of the Outer Continental Shelf in Alaska, it's comprised of over 1 billion acres that the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management must manage, um, as well as uh, 6,000 miles of coastline, which is more coastline than the rest of the United States combined. I was asked to quickly go through kind of our science priorities, how we consider decisions when it comes to science. And these are not in priority order, but there are eight broad categories I want to cover. One, marine mammals. They're good indicators of marine health, but in Alaska, they're extremely important in terms of cultural, traditional, and nutritional needs for Alaska Native peoples. Migratory birds, Alaska has international and national importance to migratory birds, not only these king eiders, <coughs> excuse me, but also shorebirds and seabirds that I'll talk about here in, in the next presentation. Alaska also has the only spring summer subsistence hunt for migratory birds that occurs from April till August that allows rural residents to harvest birds during the nesting season as well as harvest eggs. Fish, 60% of the fish products that the United States produces comes from Alaska. Fish and fishing is extremely important as you can imagine to recreational fishers, but also to subsistence uh, users. Physical oceanography, Changes in land fast ice, pack ice, hydrology, currents, water quality. These are things that BOEM has considered uh, very important and we must track because it affects industry as well as residents. Climate change, um, I doubt you will find a resident in Alaska that doesn't say climate change is occurring. Um, it has affected industry, it has affected subsistence, it affected residents. Uh, we once thought the Arctic was changing at a rate of two times the global average. It is now, uh, has been decided it is, is changing at four times the global average in the last 40 years. Socioeconomics, Alaska is blessed with 231 
recognized Native Alaska tribes, as well as 12 corporations. We work with Alaska Native peoples very closely. It's a high priority in our region, as it is for the department overall. Cumulative effects, um, like many regions, this one keeps us up at night, trying to decide how a, a proposed activity that is regulated by BOEM, how to, it affects the resources that are currently uh, being affected by current or future foreseeable uh, impacts. Finally, pollutants and contaminants. The 1989 Exxon Valdez is still on the minds of all residents of Alaska. If you go to rural villages, the number one concern is the health of their food resource. A couple of emerging issues. One, um, the administration of March this year put a moratorium on new oil and gas development in the Beaufort and Chukchi Sea. Uh, the current six leases that are there still can move forward. The second emerging issue is renewable energy. Alaska is behind the curve but we're tracking the other regions very closely. Um, this is a figure produced by the National Renewable Energy Lab that shows for wind, tidal, and wave, there's a potential of 3,800 gigawatts. Offshore wind, shown in green in the circles, has the highest potential. However, we have no active renewable energy leases in Alaska at the present time. Finally, I'll draw your attention to that orange dot right next to Cook Inlet, just to the right. Cook Inlet has one of the largest tidal power resources in the world, six to 18 gigawatts. To give you an idea, one gigawatt equals one billion watts. One billion watts has sufficient power to power 350,000 to 800,000 homes for a year. That is all of Anchorage and all of the Manuska Valley. All right, the seven profiles that we submitted for consideration of FY24, FY25 funding. Um, the first four deal with Cook Inlet because that's a geographic area that is a priority. The Lower Cook Inlet Seabird Colony Council I'll talk about here in a minute. We also are interested in Cook Inlet circulation model and calculations, a detection plan for marine non-native species, and sea ice climatology. Um, number five, we're trying to improve our models to better estimate oil and uh, weathering ice. We wanna continue funding the University of Alaska Coastal Marine Institute and the research scientists there. And finally, frequency, distribution, and severity of migratory bird strikes with vessels in near shore and offshore Alaska waters is also uh, a consideration. So I'll talk about this profile next. And um, I was asked why we selected this. One is because Lower Cook Inlet has undeveloped Outer Continental Shelf leases, there's 15 there. And as I just showed, it has tremendous wind and particularly tidal energy potential. Um, also the project design is, is still in discussion. There are trade-offs in value of information, um, cost and logistics. Um, Scott kindly provided us review comments uh, here last month. I will not go through those. We have done a response to comments, thank you. Um, they were very thoughtful and helped, I think, with the development of this project in the future. And with that, um, Stacy, I'm happy to answer questions now, or we can hold off to the study profile, whatever the committee prefers. I know we're behind schedule a bit. Yeah, thanks, Eric. I think we'll take a moment just in case there's anybody that has any immediate questions on um, sort of the Alaska region priorities or pro profiles generally. I don't see any. So with that, Eric, I'll pass it back. Great, thank you. So the study profile, we're asking the committee to consider um, updating Lower Cook Inlet seabird colonies. A bit of background, seabirds are long lived, anywhere from 20 to 50 years. They're conspicuous or above water and they feed near the top of the marine food web. Alaska supports North America's greatest concentration of seabirds. 40 to 50 million individuals come to Alaska every seven summer, that's 75% of North America's seabirds come to Alaska. Lower Cook Inlet supports 325 seabird colonies, greater than a half a million birds. The most recent estimates, however, for seabird distribution, abundance, and species composition are 40 years old. They're from 1982. And between 1950 and 2010, in the last 60 years, the global seabird population has declined by nearly 
70%. In terms of our information needs, um, when one writes an affected environment in a National Environmental Policy Act document, you need to know the very basic information on distribution, species composition, and abundance, in this case, seabirds and Cook Inlet. BOEM also needs to know threats to seabirds, whether it's marine heat waves, disease, vessel traffic, fisheries, bycatch, pollution contaminants, or invasive species. I want to draw your attention to marine heat waves in this figure that's produced by the Fish and Wildlife Service. The top shows a timeline from 1970 to 2020, so a 50 year time period. The, um, the timeline circled in yellow comes from 1970 to 2010, so 40 years. During that 40 year time period, there were five seabird die off events. So five seabird events over 40 years, totaling about a million species. However, in the last decade, we've had nearly double the number of seabird die off events, nine. And in the last 10 years, we've had an equal number of seabird estimated deaths, 1 million. So in the last decade, we've equaled the last 40 years combined. So why does BOEM need to know the distribution, species composition and abundance? And why do we need to know threats? Because the agency is required to assess and mitigate potential effects of our regulated activities, be it infrastructure siting, vessel corridors, and oil spill risk, as well as preparedness. The species objective, to estimate seabird distribution, species composition, and abundance in the 325 existing colonies, as well as potential new colonies that cropped up in the last 40 years. Define priority areas on abundance, species richness, conservation status, or possibly other criteria. We wanna evaluate existing and new survey methods and technologies. Since 40 years, we have new technologies that we can use that likely better estimate populations and distribution. And finally, we wanna develop a protocol that can be used in the future that's rigorous, has confidence, repeatability, is logistically feasible, and of course can meet cost of agencies. The methods, as I said, we wanna develop a protocol that has specific methods. The methods that will be employed in this study will be boat, using both boat and aerial platforms, aerial being fixed wing, rotor, helicopter, and unmanned platforms, using both visual and photographic techniques. And then because some of these species are cleverly conceal themselves in burrows or crevices, we will use marine band radar to detect where they're at. So the research questions are very similar to the objectives. What's the current distribution, species composition, and abundance of seabirds in the Lower Cook Inlet? Most importantly, what changes have occurred? We know that the global population overall has declined by 70%. We've had significant marine heat waves in 2015 through 2016. So we're very interested to see what has possibly changed. And relative to the methods that are being proposed, we wanna estimate distribution abundance and species composition relative to bias detection, feasibility and cost. All of the methods that I talked about have their pluses and minuses. And finally, the requested input from the committee. Um, one can prioritize seabird colonies any numbers of ways. Here's a few criteria that could be considered. Species distribution, abundance species richness, species diversity, conservation status by that is a species population stable, expected to be declining or is it healthy and increasing? Productivity and the importance finally to subsistence users. Subsistence users depend on seabirds often, uh, both for harvesting the bird itself as well as for eggs. Addressing statistical difficulty, this project has all the factors that give biometricians heartburn. Um, we're trying to estimate distribution and abundance in a remote, logically challenged area. Not only that, we have 21 species, 21 species across the broad area that nest in three sorts of habitats, um, some on the open, some on the surface, uh, some in crevices, and some on cliffs. Um, cumulative impacts, as I mentioned, is a, uh, 
significant interest in this study in terms of seabirds are already incurring significant stressors. And, is, and uh, we are interested in hearing the committee's thoughts on how to tease that apart relative to regulated activities uh, by the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. And finally, what's the optimal frequency of lower Cook Inlet seabird surveys? We're pretty much assured 40 years is too long. Uh, the issue is then how often, because one has trade-offs to whether you do other types of surveys or not. And with that, I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you, Eric. I'll be um, looking online and in the room for hands and there's already a number up. So I'll start with um, Dan Costa and then Kevin, Katrine, uh, Rona and Deepanjana. A very interesting uh, presentation. I, I, I think those 40 year studies were done by OCSEP, which was a really important program that sort of set the stage for a lot of other environmental studies, also trained a lot of us. I was a postdoc under that program. Your, your bird studies, as you've already said, are challenging. And I, I, I think you've really addressed the issues well. Uh, and answers to those are going to be hard, but it's it's important to recognize that seabirds are a long-lived species, and so the frequency it's it's very it's not uncommon, especially for Alaska, for seabirds to have a series of bad years and then one good year, and so you know, many of these seabirds, especially the kittiwakes, live forty years, and so they only have to have a couple of good seasons in order to maintain the population. So that's a real challenge, and I, I'm not going to pretend to give to have an answer to that. I would say that your first cut would be distribution and abundance because that's fundamental. And then of course you need to get productivity to be able to assess the population trajectory. And then the last thing I'd say is given, given the problem of attribution of an effect, as you've pointed out, there's are the populations in the in the area are already declining. And in terms of who's funding it, it does. If the develop if the companies fund it, it's going to. There is always the issue whether it's true or not of of uh, perception, and so it it would be best that some independent entity at least supports the work or at least puts a firewall between the researchers and and if it's funded by the developers. Uh, but again, I think it's critical because you've already shown a decline. As soon as you put it, you know there's going to be further declines and or even uh, a, a bad impact year, and people are going to immediately look at the public, whether it's true or not, are immediately going to look at the new activity and say that's the fault. But anyway, it was a very interesting overview. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Um, all good comments, and I, I would agree, distribution and abundance. We're, I think we also have to throw in species composition as well, just because some species, I think, are more greatly affected by the heat waves and others in terms of, um, but you're, you raise good points uh, uh, and things that I'm sure we're gonna be discussing in the future, so thank you. Kevin? Yeah, thanks, that was a, that was a great presentation, Eric. Uh, and uh, um, so I had a couple of uh, questions. I, I'm really supportive of this, this proposed, uh, this project. Um, are any one of the ways to classify it as well? You listed a, a, a number, but are there any uh, UNESCO designated bird? Um, UNESCO being the like the, the 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 national designation or international designation for where you have more than I think it's ten percent of the uh, entire species in an area at the time. I know that's uh, that's something that uh, like up in the Bay of Fundy that's that it's designated for birds yeah. as a as a it's a UNESCO site, and I think you you might want to take a look at that too, because that has kind of international okay. consequences. Um, the other thing I wanted to to mention is the um, uh, there's there's been regime shifts, right, in the in in the uh, the marine structure and the uh, food web structure in in Alaska, uh, going from a, a fish fish base to I think to 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 a crustacean, and also there's some of AJ Paul's work and the work on the Exxon Valdez oil spill where they looked at you know, the decline of the herring 
mm -hmm. uh, populations and how they're uh, uh, the increase in um, walleye pollock, which is a energetically weaker uh, fish. And so, so bird uh, colonies were starving, even though they were mm -hmm. eating as much as they could. And so, so I, I think maybe incorporating some of that, I'm surprised that you know, it's been so long since those areas of Cook Inlet have looked at as far as bird colonies. But anyway, it's a great project. I, I, I think it's very, very worthwhile. Yeah, thank you, Kevin. We, um, I'm not aware of any species that are on any list. I know tufted puffin has shown significant declines in the Pacific and Alaska. Um, relative to collaborating with other agencies, USGS, the Alaska Science Center, John Pyatt and others um, are working on two islands to talk about, and they've been looking at for several last several years, looking at changes in food and um, what has resulted from the 2015-16 heat wave, and then ultimately changes in the, in the fish communities, and then that affects, of course, the seabird communities. And what's interesting is it appears to be quite longer. The extent of the impacts are going to be longer than what we would, what I would have expected. Yeah, good points. Thank you. Katrine. Yeah, thank you. Um, I too echo the uh, strong support for this <laughs> for this project. I think it's very important. Um, a couple of questions and then a couple of comments towards your uh, input um, that you're seeking. One question is: um, I'm assuming that it refers to the entire Lower Cook Inlet um, uh, management region, including Shalikov Strait. Correct. Yeah, yeah I think yes. that would be really important just yep. because of travel. Uh, tr vessel traffic uh, in, in that entire region. And um, then uh, going back to the um, uh, coordination with uh, USGS, uh, I'm assuming that's mostly the work of uh, at sea distribution and relationship to food, as you said. Um, so I think that would be a really good uh, complement, uh, knowing the, the seabird breeding locations with at sea distribution. Mm. Um, and USGS, of course, in part is also involved in other long term monitoring projects uh, such as Gulf Watch Alaska. Um, and so I think there would be some really valuable uh, connections to be made, which then would bring uh, a little bit more uh, resolution to uh, what. Uh, you know, what are the in individual impacts? Because those long-term monitoring projects are needed to identify uh, what, what comes with heat waves or whatever, while the seabird colony um, um, establishment will not tell you that, right? And that in itself. Right. But um, seabird colonies themselves don't change that much. The abundance of birds that are there change. Mm -hmm. um, so I think uh, in terms of the question, how to prioritize, I would probably prioritize those a little bit larger seabird colonies that have a mix of um, different species in terms of their uh, nesting strategies, so that you have the ones that are, you know, ledge nesters versus crevice nesters versus borrowers, mm -hmm. and um, not something that's like just super scattered. And then I, I do think that uh, in terms of um, logistical challenges. If there is one region in Alaska that these challenges can be reasonably overcome, it's Lower Cook Inlet. <laughs> I mean, it's very accessible, um, and uh, but it's also a high, pink, high impact region because of that vessel traffic and everything. So I think um, that is a, a, a very important region to, to do these surveys. Um, and I am not a bird expert, there might be others, but I think if you, you know, uh, yes, 40 years are too long, but maybe eight to 10 years or something like this as a time frame for resurveys would be something to target. Thank you. Um, yes, I'm in complete agreement. I, there's some, you know, USGS is still on both Gull and Chiswick Island and Cook Inlet. They're still doing um, prey uh, and food habits and food quality in terms of the length of sand last and nutritional quality. So, um, and you're right, tying food resources with colonies and their success and their species distribution, I think will be a key. Yep, thank you. Rona. I agree with everybody else. I think this is a fantastic um, project and, and I really appreciate it and enjoyed your presentation of it. Um, harking back to your list of projects in your first presentation, I was really pleased to see a focus on invasive species and uh, and having and I would I would love to see that 
move forward. Um, but I think also there are potential wonderful synergies between um, uh, um, monitoring and looking for early detection of invasive species or non-native species in general, and this work with bird colonies, because of course, it, you know, on some level it speaks to the overall composition of the food web. And, and, and so I think that both these projects could benefit from each other. Thank you, yep, good idea. Um, and the, the last hand that I see raised is um, Deepanjana. So I'll turn to the next. Um, oh, and then Rob Surian as well has raised their hand. So um, we'll take those two, two additional comments and questions. Uh, hello, everybody. And uh, again, and uh, this is, I also agree that this is a very uh, nice uh, pr uh, project. Uh, my one comment I have already posted in the um, in the chat. Then the other point which I'd like to mention that in this study you have already you are trying to uh, find out the reasons for how this uh, bird population is changing. So my submission would be that uh, shouldn't you also consider that how uh, this. Uh, how this uh, number of bar, uh, how this bird species can be conserved, maybe even in a challenging situation by altering the food uh, or the altering the habitats. Thank you. Um, good point. Yes, I mean, I um, food obviously is tied to breeding success and productivity, and whether birds actually nest or not, and so. Um, um, the difficulty is there's only uh, so much time and and uh, abilities for a research project to take on. I, um, as Katrin mentioned, I think food is very important in terms of distribution, probably of key importance for uh, breeding birds. But at this point, we're we're not going to consider um, sampling food resources at these colonies. I think it's given the size of uh, the study area, which is about 360 kilometers long and 30 to 90 kilometers wide and 325 colonies. I think it's gonna be a challenge to pull that off. I think in the future, however, um, looking at food resources with what colonies are successful or which colonies have changed, I think is very viable. And Rob. Great, thanks for the opportunity to uh, comment on this study. Uh, a couple points I'd like to make that um, somewhat echo what's already been said, but then a couple of additional considerations. So um, just to kind of reemphasize the, the heat wave um, in recent years from 2000, especially 15, 16, and then again in 19, caused uh, major mortality events for um, even adult birds and mammals in this recent region, and especially with um, recent uh, publications now showing that um, both sea lions, humpback whales, along with birds, there was uh, major mortality events for adult breeding populations. So a couple things to keep in mind in terms of um, this survey timing. One is that any counts that were done before 2015 are no longer valid um, in this region. And, and also thinking about frequency, there's this statistical consideration of how frequent you should sample. But when you have these episodic events, uh, that's the other point at which you consider uh, resurveying to when there's a, a step change. And it's, it's definitely evidence is accumulating that this region of the Gulf of Alaska um, kind of Cook Inlet toward Prince William Sound especially was heavily hit um, more so by the heat wave in terms of impacts and including birds from all over other regions in Alaska. So there's Fish and Wildlife Service is looking at some results that indicate they're seeing declines in other bird colonies with MERS especially that they think were overwintering at the time in this region that are affecting other colonies of Bering Sea and elsewhere. Um, so, uh, and then in terms of which uh, colonies might be most important, um, certainly those in Cook Inlet, um, and also at the entrance, the Barren Islands would be key, um, but then also those items that are, 
or those colonies that are kind of downstream, which would be toward Kodiak, Shalikov Strait. Um, but like I just mentioned with other colonies too, a lot of birds overwinter or feed in this area from colonies both upstream and downstream of the, of the region. Um, and then also um, as far as, yeah, just to echo what Katrin said too with the partnerships, because some of these species, you know, the service nesters are relatively easy, but a lot of burrow nesters between, um, you know, the radar studies and others, it's, it's very hard to get a good estimate on how many are there. And I think it's really important to partner with the at sea surveys and, and Boehm's already funding a super important study in Lower Cook Inlet that is doing um, vessel based surveys, um, which does a good job of capturing all species. Um, and yeah, USGS is leading that. Um, and um, yeah, I guess I'll leave it at that. But yeah, thanks very much for this opportunity. Thank you for joining us, Rob. And thank yeah. you, Eric. Yeah, please respond if you have. Thank you, Rob. Um, all thoughtful comments. Um, and yeah, as you mentioned um, or cite, the, the project is going to be challenging in terms of um, the two month time period that seabirds nest and the numbers of species and the numbers of different types of habitats, as well as a, the proposed uh, methods that we um, will probably use. Um, collaboration is absolutely key to success. There's several agencies, the National Park Service is there, US Fish and Wildlife Service with Alaska Maritime Refuge, um, USGS and US Forest Service, all those are potential partners in the future to, to work through this to, to try to make it happen. So anyway, thank you. Fantastic. Well, that wraps up our um, consideration of the profiles for uh, the 2024-2025 SDP. Uh, we really appreciate, or I really appreciate at the very least, um, all of the invited guests that joined us, all of the BOEM staff that joined online and here in person, um, and of course, and especially our uh, volunteer committee members for their time. Um, I wanted to leave a little bit of time here towards the end of our open session for some concluding thoughts and remarks from our co-chairs as well as um, from the BOEM staff. So if um, anybody would like to, to leave some parting thoughts, um, I open the floor for that now and maybe I'll start with our co-chairs. Well, I'll have a crack at it. Um, uh, thank you, everybody. It's been an excellent meeting. It's been, I've been involved with BOEM for a long number of years. This has been one of um, the best and most productive um, sessions related to the SDP that, that I've been involved with. And so thank you very much, everybody. Um, thank you to the leadership in BOEM and, and uh, the National Academies for putting this together. Um, thank you for to the profile developers. I know that you're very busy. I know you put a lot of effort into it and also for the other folks in BOEM and the other SMEs for their contributions. I know they're actively involved throughout this profile development and can, will continue to be so uh, going forward. Our outside experts have clearly added a lot to our discussions. This is the most that we've had in any of these uh, meetings that I've been involved with. And so I'm sure that we will want to continue doing that into the future. And of course, to the COSA members for your time and effort and wise wisdom. Um, I think one of the things that we've discussed is that uh, on COSA is that we're keen to understand what happens next, what happens to these profiles going forward. Um, so maybe we can have some discussions about um, the way that our contributions have um, uh, shaped the profiles or will shape the profiles uh, going forward. And the only other thing I like to say is happy birthday to the studies, um, to the ESP. Um, maybe maybe the another 50 years. I won't be around to see it, but. Yeah. Boy, it's, I, I, I echo everything that uh, Rod said. I think you hit it right on the mark there, Rod. Thank you everybody for your contributions. It's been an exceptional two days. I've been through, I think it's the eighth one of these uh, annual reviews I've sat through. And I think this was uh, a highlight in those eight years. So I think everybody did a great job. Uh, I particularly want to commend the BOEM staff for their hard work in pulling their profiles together and also their receptiveness to the feedback. I really want to thank our outside guests. We uh, had a, uh, we, we, I think we all, all of us worked hard to try to identify a and, and recruit some outside guests who would be able to contribute to the discussion. And, and you all have done a great job. So many thanks to all of you. Um, 
we really appreciate it. Thank you to the uh, uh, COSA, COSA members and our National Academy staff for, for organizing this along with their, their colleagues at, at BOEM. So well done all. I would also like to reiterate that there is an opportunity still, uh, if you have any more comments that you wanna share, uh, please uh, send them to Stacy. Stacy's raised her hand here and she will make sure that those written comments uh, get transmitted to the appropriate folks at BOEM. Um, I think uh, those uh, those are very, very, very helpful for folks. So thank you everyone for an excellent two days and uh, yeah, on to an, the next 50. Yeah, and, and, and I certainly agree. It has been fantastic. I think we just keep getting better each time. No, we just, just keep getting a little better each time. Uh, we've been doing this for a while and it, uh, I think the, uh, it was a fantastic meeting. The um, uh, comments were extremely thoughtful and really appreciate the committee taking the time to uh, really put a lot of thought in, in, into the profiles and the feedback. I mean, it's, it's extremely helpful. I mean, our, our folks, you know, spend time among all the other duties they have really trying to put these ideas together, um, you know, and, uh, you know, it's it, it, it's difficult. So I think a program uh, of our uh, stature, uh, a use inspired science program like we have needs a committee like this for for input, it makes us better. It makes us stronger, and and you know, I think it's really really helpful. Uh, having the uh, the outside experts, uh, I think that does really add a lot uh, to things because you know each year things may evolve, as you all know, and um, so it's really important to have these outside experts. Uh, so um, you know, with, with the committee, you're not going to pivot the committee members, but with the, with the committee, just the way it is, and and, and stands for several years. And then bringing in these experts, I think, are extremely helpful. Um, <clears throat> I do want to uh, yeah, thank all of the BOEM uh, scientists and staff for all, all the great work, um, putting all the time into these ideas and uh, into the committee. Um, Stacy, Jessica, thank you so much. Uh, and I think somebody that's forgotten sometimes is Dr. John Lilly, who's sitting behind because he's the guy that gets all these profiles together and somehow puts it into a study development plan uh, that that really makes this roll. So, uh, so thank you. Oh, and oh, we're gonna go to Tonic and have a toast for the 50th anniversary. Tonic is a couple of, it's a little uh, bar a couple of blocks away. So I'm not exactly sure where it is, but I know it's close. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thanks. And before I do adjourn, I, I want to echo the thanks to John. In fact, I was thinking about that as we were speaking, um, not only pulling the, the studies development plan together, but also ensuring that um, the profiles, the slides, everything got um, transmitted to us in an extremely timely uh, and organized way. And so major props to John and, and thanks for that as well. Um, with that, we are adjourning a few minutes early, so you know Rodney and, and friends um, can get, can can go scope out some spots, maybe to hang out. Um, I do encourage uh, committee members if they're available after we adjourn our closed session to feel free to to join for this very informal, unofficial gathering. <laughs> um, and we'll look forward to. Um, to seeing folks again in the fall. And I just will preview for our bone folks that some of our discussion in closed session will involve um, thinking forward to our fall and spring meetings. Um, so we look forward to collaborating with you all on getting those organized. Thanks again. <laughs>